this is Wednesday, right? Um, being nine o'clock, I will open the public hearing for Senate Bill 130, and we will be in recess for just a few minutes.
morning. Um, we're reopening the public hearing on Senate Bill 130, and we recognize Grant Bosey, speaking for Senator Abbas. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman Roy, members of the Criminal Justice Committee. I'm Grant Bosey from the New Hampshire Senate, introducing Senate Bill 130 on behalf of Senator Darrell Abbas, the bill's prime sponsor. This bill came from a request from the Judicial Branch, which is responsible for ensuring the safety of all of New Hampshire's courts. The Police Standards and Training Council has the expertise and infrastructure to provide high quality training for law enforcement and security officers, but it currently lacks authority under RSA 106L to provide that training to court security officers. SB 130 would enable the Police Standards and Training Council to enter into an agreement at the request of Chief Justice McDonald to institute a court security officer education, training, and certification program. This would allow New Hampshire to standardize security training across all our courts while preparing officers for the specific challenges of keeping our courthouses safe and secure. If you have questions for Senator Abbas, I'll make sure to get you an answer. But for today, I would defer to Director Skipper and the Judicial Branch on the need for this legislation. Senator Abbas, thanks you for your consideration and support of Senate Bill 130. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please uh, tell Senator Abbas um, we're sorry that he couldn't break away and join us today. Thank you. At this point, I, the chair calls um, Attorney Head. That's fine. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Richard Head. I'm the Government Affairs Coordinator for the Judicial Branch. Um, with me at the table is Diane Martin, the Director of the Administrative Office of Courts. Also in the room, just in case there are any questions, Jason Jordan Hazy is our Manager of Security Operations. Um, so there may be, if you have any questions that he may need to address, he's available. And Director Sippa of Police Standards and Training is also in the room. Um, if there are any questions that he may need to address. Um, as Mr. Bossi said, this is a request of the, a bill that is a request of the judicial branch. Currently, um, we have court security officers who manage all the security operations within our circuit courts. They train themselves, so they develop their own training program, they implement that training, and they train themselves. And as I've talked about many times before this committee, one of our significant issues is resources. So we're taking resources away from our security personnel whose job it is to provide security within our courthouses and developing on an annual basis training for uh, our court security officers and our sheriffs who are doing this court security within the, in the superior courts. And really that is a, a drain on really what it is is their primary focus. The other aspect of, of why we brought this bill forward is that um, we're, in, we're, we're not professional trainers within our court security pr program. We have individuals who are experts at providing court security, but they're not sort of in their day-to-day -day business staying up to date on the late, latest training issues, the latest sort of um, uh, ways in which um, court security needs to be managed from a, from a security basis. So what we would like to do and what this bill does is simply is it simply provides an enabling statute to authorize police standards and training to enter into an agreement with the judicial branch to be able to provide that level of training um, that we believe is appropriate for court security officers and to with uh, the chief justice, with uh, Mr. Jordan Hazy, uh, the sheriffs and police standards and training, develop that program sort of building off of our existing training program. So what this bill does is simply creates, a, it simply enables police standards and training to enter into that conversation with the judicial branch to implement a court security training program through uh, police standards and training. Um, the other aspect of, of why this bill is being brought forward is just the inherent uh, nature of having our own people train ourselves. 
you know, best practice does provide for having a third party come in and oversee that training, and that would be police standards and training uh, in this case. So we want to be able to, you know, have our folks trained by folks who are professional trainers who are uh, maintaining sort of the day-to-day -day knowledge of the latest issues in, in training. Um, but all that said, our court security officers remain employees of the judicial branch. So they are still subject to all the policies and procedures that all judicial branch employees are required to, uh, to follow at, at all times. Um, and I'll just turn it over to uh, Director Martin just to sort of talk through some of the conversations she's had with police standards and training and how sort of we look forward to working with them in terms of developing this program. Good morning, members of the committee. Um, as um, Richard said, I am the director of the administrative office of the courts and the court security function falls within the administrative office. And I am very proud to be able to work with all of these individuals who do this job. We have a variety of people who do it. Some are retired law enforcement, some are not. And so training is very, very important to the work that they do because of the various types of individuals that we get. Um, and so when the chief came into this role a couple of years ago, he identified this as a priority for him to institute training, work with police standards and training, and to really professionalize our court security there from an equipment, training, all of the resources that they need to do this job well. And so we reached out to police standards and training and have been engaging with um, Director Skippa to try to work on this concept. So we would love to have your support to move this forward and to engage with them to make this happen. Thank you very much. With that, we conclude our comments, but we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. So would this, would the current officers be, be um, mandated to go to this training as well, or would they be grandfathered? Is there a physical fitness aspect to it that you're contemplating? So thank you for the question. The, the exact details are, have still need to be worked out. There clearly are going to be different levels of experience of folks coming into our program and people are currently in the program, whether they have a long history in law enforcement or not will sort of depend on possibly the, the modules that they would have to engage in. Um, and, and so there, I think there's going to be a one, a phase in of existing employees and then within as new employees come in and are undergoing the training, you know, they may already have undertaken some of the training that would be in all of the modules and, and only do some of them. Details of that program still need to be worked out in the, in the conversations between the judicial branch and police standards and training. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions from the committee? Rep uh, Representative Muse. Yes, thank you. Um, one of the things I'm trying to trying to figure out is how uh, the training uh, that would be offered under police standards and training might differ from uh, the training that's offered now in terms of subject matter, in terms of length, in terms of certification requirements. Can you maybe go one more level of detail? Sure. Um, so thank you for the question. I think the, again, while the details still need to be worked out, as, as I mentioned, we do currently have a program that we've developed internally. Um, so I think that is going to be the, the bones of, of any training program that is conducted by police standards and training. Um, and if you want more detail in terms of the existing CSO program, either uh, Director Martin or, or Jason can speak more detail than I can. But I think what, in terms of process, Jason uh, Jordan Hazy, our securities manager, is going to be working with uh, the sheriffs and police standards and training in sort of taking our current program and implementing that through police standards and training, but adding on to that any additional sort of things that they say, you know, this is this, you may need to bring this into your program, stuff we haven't thought of, but maybe saying, you know, here's an area that you may need to implement through your people that you're not currently training on. We may say, okay, that's you know another module we want to add into the program. Um, but I think the bones of it will be our existing program. Seeing no further questions. Actually, um, 
I have one real quick. Is are you aware of is there is there a national um, set of best practices or standards or certifications that that are already in existence? Uh, I'm not sure if there's a standard. Jason can answer that, but we do participate with the national um, center, and um, Jason and his team participate with that group in, in determining what appropriate standards are. Is there actually a standard? National Center for State Courts for years uh, to come up with that criteria and actually uh, volunteered my time to help uh, come up with that sort of criteria uh, to help us, you know, as we kind of maintain our uh, training programs. So we could act theoretically be on the cutting edge of setting up a standard. Yes, sir. That could go national. Absolutely. Okay. Which, which again, you know, folding police standards into our sort of training program again, like you said, it, it makes a good program better. Okay, um, and I hate to do this, but since you talked, you have to fill out a pink card. No problem at all. <laughs> Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Is there thank else? you. Thank you very much. Um, based on uh, everything you heard, Director Skipper, do you feel you need to add anything? or You just don't want to fill out that card, do you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Seeing so, you no further questions, and is there anyone else wishing to testify who has not testified on this bill? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. And the committee will be in recess until 9.30.
At this point, we are opening the public hearing on Senate Bill 249. And I, who's going to, oh, wow, Senator Abbas is here. The chair recognizes Senator Abbas. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the House Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. It's an honor to be back here. If, for those of you who didn't serve on this committee last term, I used to chair this committee, and Representative Rory was my uh, vice chair. So it's a pleasure to be back. Hopefully this goes well. So Senate Bill 249, This for the members that were on this committee last term, this language may look very familiar. Uh, this language, which I helped draft, actually passed in the Senate twice, it was part of a much larger bill. I believe it was Senate Bill 294, or maybe 292. And what this, this is a limited policy. It applies to issues of bail, but we're only addressing situations where a person has been arrested for a crime, and we're talking about a felony, a Class A misdemeanor, or drunk driving. All other Class B uh, misdemeanors and violations would not apply. If that person's released on bail pending their trial and gets arrested again, and now we're talking about another felony, Class A misdemeanor or drunk driving, and they get released a second time. Now, when upon being released the third time, if they were get, to get arrested again while the first and second charge is still open, that, and that would also have to be a felony, a Class A misdemeanor, or drunk driving. At that point, there's gonna be a presumption. It, the burden is now gonna to shift to the defendant to, because the presumption is if they were released, they will not abide by the conditions of their release by not getting arrested. For any type of bail conditions I've ever heard of or seen, one of the conditions is, is that you not commit any new offenses. You don't get arrested again. So what this is saying is, because you violate those conditions twice already on offenses that you can go to jail for or drunk driving, uh, we're not going to give you the benefit of the doubt now that you're just going to abide by these conditions. And we're, we hear the term catch and release, catch and release. I don't really like that term, but that's where it comes from, is where someone gets arrested, they get released, they get arrested again. But people are getting arrested for multiple offenses, and these are all in a short period of time. So think about the amount of resources between the court, the police, uh, we're doing a lot of putting a lot of time into and money and expenses into dealing with this, and there's no consequence for violating the conditions of your release. I would suggest if you don't support this policy, you examine why you even have conditions of your release in the first place. Why have them if you can violate them without consequence? In my my humble opinion, that is an unnecessary provision at that point. I'm not agreeing that we go in that direction, because that would basically turn the entire bail system upside down. But if you continue to violate your conditions, there needs to be a consequence. And this is setting a clear policy of when it would apply. The existing law does permit, it says the burden will shift and there'll be a rebuttable presumption, but it's, it's different interpretations of when that rebuttable presumption would apply. Is it the second arrest? This makes it very clear, I'm gonna do it on the third time, and that's it. And that's how it should be. It's a very clear policy on when it would be applicable. It also, I believe it's very reasonable. I, I mean, think about this. You have to be arrested for jailable offenses three times on three separate occasions for different crimes, different events in a short period of time. That's what this applies to. This is a reasonable policy. It addresses a, what I would say an unintended consequence of what bail reform was passed a few years back. And I think this is a good policy for public safety concerns. And I'll answer any questions. Representative Pru. Why are we waiting until the third time and not the second? Did you get pushed back if you tried the second? Well, that's a good question. So considering that this policy didn't pass last term at, as being the third time, I don't believe it didn't pass because people thought it was too lenient. So I wouldn't, although I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to such a policy, I, I do believe in working together and trying to come to a compromise on a, on a practical 
reasonable policy. And sometimes these crimes aren't always related. So drunk driving, yes, it's a public safety concern, but it is a class B misdemeanor. So if you had a, you know, a violent offense and then three months later you get a drunk driving charge, those are separate from each other that you don't have the same victim per se. So I understand there are circumstances where this can be a very tight policy. I think three is more than reasonable and there's really no excuse for that, especially after being arrested the second time. Representative Selig. Thank you for taking my question. Um, yesterday, some of us were able to go toward the court system and talk with them about some of the issues. And one thing that was apparent was the extreme shortage of public defenders, which was leading some people to have their trials continued for six to nine months at least before arraignment. Um, how are those people, if they have no attorney for six months, eight months, 10 months, a year, how long is, are they subject to, to this if they have perhaps an addiction issue or some other challenge? So, so I, this won't solve the shortage of public defenders. Either way, whether regardless of whether the case is continued, it, if that's done by agreement, that's the choice of the defendant to leave the case open. Uh, I would say I would not advise if I would not advise for a continuance because you have a right to a speedy trial. There are some benefits of moving the case forward, but there's also benefits, perhaps strategy-wise, of delaying the case. I won't get into the many fact patterns of why. But that's a, if that's ultimately the right to have a speedy trial, if they want to raise that argument, they can. But in this case, it's still three times. That's another reason for why perhaps maybe two, you know, having this strict policy on a second offense might be too stringent because it can be delayed at no fault of the uh, defendant. But it's not, an, it's not an automatic situation where the person will be held awaiting trial. They have to then rebut the presumption, explain why they, if they are released, they're not going to now get arrested a fourth time. If they can present that argument in a persuasive manner and, and explain why these were separate offenses, perhaps if they were um, had substance abuse issues and weren't getting treated, but then gut treatment, it's perhaps less likely they'll violate the conditions of their release. So I think that's an argument that you have to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis. And just to maybe answer your question, if you recall, um, what we heard was if they were being held, the public defender was assigned right away versus if they're out that's when the six months or a year thing so um, if that helps um just went, who we got oh representative newell thank you mr chair and thank you for taking my question um i agree with the spirit and and that I, my question is how does this reconcile with innocent until proven guilty because at this point you're what you're saying is um and i'm sure that there's you know it's demonstrable um something that is violent or you know that kind of stuff my question is how do you reconcile it you know them not actually being convicted of a crime and still suffering the consequences of you know being um deemed as guilty of that crime so innocent until proven guilty that beyond a reasonable doubt that that's the tr that's the trial standard. So you're pres there's a presumption of innocent, yes. What we're talking about is when you're released on bail, there's conditions of your release. For example, do not use drugs or alcohol. That can be a condition. If you violate the condition of your release, the, the state, and this is a common throughout all the states, that they actually are allowed to revoke your bail, whether it's pending trial or for a certain time period. One of those conditions, and I've sat through more arraignment hearings than I can count. I've represented many criminal defendants. I can't, I can't uh, give you an exact number. I've never encountered a circumstance where one of the conditions of their release was to not get arrested for any new offenses. So what's happening is the violation of their conditions of their release is the fact that they got arrested and charged with a new offense and that's why the language uses a probable cause. It says, prob it says probable cause because that's the standard for the arrest. If, if you go to court and you defeat it on a probable cause argument, it won't actually uh, result in your bail being revoked because you've now defeated that case. Representative uh, Sue Newman. Yes, thank you for taking my question. You had mentioned in your testimony a, sh a re arrest within a short period of time. Is there a definition of what this short period of time is? 
or does that depend on what their current bail status is? Does that drive it? The, the, the time period is not in here. When I say short period of time, look at it this way. The majority, overwhelming majority of the population is able to live their lives without getting arrested. Never mind three times while the first and second case is still open. So when I say short period of time, relatively, you're talking about within a one year time period, uh, give or take. To be arrested that many times, uh, you're, you're dealing with a person who's not abiding by the conditions of their release, but also committing multiple criminal offenses without, without consequence to the conditions of their release in the first place. And when you have a bail hearing, the state is, is at their discretion. They can argue for a high cash bail if they want. They can argue a lot of different conditions. But part of it, the conditions of the release is it's often even done by agreement of the parties. We agree on these conditions and they don't follow the conditions. So I, I, I think that's something that needs to be factored in. Now we're talking about a third violation. So short period of time, I would say is, you know, while the first one's still open, so. Representative Muse. Thank you for, <clears throat> for taking my question. Um, looking at the bill, um, one of the things that I see is I see the addition of your language, um, uh, but right up above it, there's a lot of stuff that's, uh, that's struck out. And some of the things that are struck out, that first line, uh, something I'm, I'm curious about is it appears that we already have a rebuttable presumption in the statute uh, that somebody, if if somebody uh, who is already on release doesn't abide with the conditions of, of their release, um, that's something the court can look at. And bail, my understanding is that it's within the power of the court to actually revoke bail. So one of the things I, I struggle with a little bit in these bills is when I look at our current statute, I see that the power to do that is there, the flexibility to do that is there, but for some reason, uh, it doesn't appear to be getting done. And what I'm curious about is whether or not you think this actually fixes that problem. Thank you for the question. What I can tell you is this, this is the, the current law is being interpreted and applied differently depending on where you get arrested and which court you're appearing and which judge you're appearing in front of. And you would like to think that it's the zip code of where you can get arrested shouldn't really play into it or the judge that happens to be sitting in that court on that particular day. So that, to me, this is a clearer policy. It's also not clear when, so the, if the burden shifts and now there's a rebuttable presumption to the defendant, it's not clear what happens to that party. It, the law is actually not written clear on how the court should handle that. It doesn't say what the, what the consequence is of violating the conditions. It kind of leaves it open-ended. Mm -hmm. So you're getting inconsistent results. This creates a clear policy on what, and I, I would even suggest this was the intent of the original draft, but it also makes it clear what happened on the third offense where the original draft, if you were to interpret it you know, really narrowly and strictly, they could be held on the second offense. This makes it clear when the, that presumption shifts and what would happen when it does and how to overcome it. Follow up, please. Follow up. As a defense attorney, and uh, I believe you said that you, uh, you have defended uh, numerous clients um, uh, in criminal cases, one of the things, um, uh, one of the things that, um, one of the things that I think is part of our judicial system is the idea that uh, that the circumstances of different individuals are different, uh, which is one of the reasons why we have uh, judicial and prosecutorial uh, discretion. Um, it looks like this particular bill would remove that uh, that discretion in these cases. Do I have that right? I can, my experience is that if the prosecutor does not want the person to be held and they make that recommendation, that is something that the court would favorably take into consideration when applying this policy. Uh, what I will tell you, the prosecutor, if they, if they don't want to actually prosecute the person and the person's been arrested, I'm surprised that they would be advancing the case in the first place. I would think there's an ethical issue when you 
file a case, whether criminal or civil, there's a obligation that you intend on seeing that case through. And if they don't intend on seeing it through, they shouldn't be issuing the complaint or addressing it any further. It's not just the fact that they've been arrested. They've been arrested with a new charge, and that charge, you would have to have probable cause. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my, my take. I don't think you're taking the discretion away. Thank you. Representative Bolden. Thanks for taking my question. Um, the fiscal note is interesting. It's really long, um, but it has a lot of zeros. Um, it says on the back, the judicial branch assumes this bill would result in an increase in the number of bail hearings and associated costs, but they're unable to quantify the size of the increase. And then they also talk in the next, I think the next to last paragraph about the impact on county budgets, um, which is, you know, something that we, uh, the House members set um, as far as the cost of running the county jails. But they're very clear that they have no idea what the increase um, tax rate would be um, because it depends on so many factors. Do you have any estimates for that? If anyone gave an estimate, it would be, they would be guessing because there's no way to really quantify how many people are going get, to get arrested who are already out on bail for their second and third offense. So will there be a fiscal impact on the court? If you're going to have people in court, people being held, there's a fiscal impact. There's also a fiscal impact of processing all these extra cases. It's a fiscal impact on the county sheriff's department and on law enforcement of constantly having to arrest the same person. One of the reasons why I support drunk driving being in here, and this was a few years back, I had someone call me, and it wasn't a constituent, but it was someone in New Hampshire, and they had a family member who was arrested for drunk driving five times in a two-month period. And they, <clears throat> they were wondering, well, how could that happen? And I had to explain, well, they haven't been convicted of the first, so they're not being charged the second, third, or fourth offense. What's happening is, is your system, your bail system is a problem. This person kept getting released. And for someone to not have an extensive criminal record and all of a sudden have five drunk driving arrests in a short period of time, that seemed like a person in crisis. And simply releasing that person I didn't think was a benefit to the public or to that person at, at this point. I, I don't know all the details of each of those charges and what went into each one of them, but to have that many in one period of time, you're talking about how many resources are going in. You're, you're, you have to arrest the person, you have to then process the person, then there's a, the case goes to court, it's now an open file. If they have a public defender or they're hiring private counsel, it's t clogging up the court system. So this is the hope is this, this will cut down on the amount of repeat offenses, which ha also has a fiscal impact, I think, in a positive way. So hopefully they offset in an equitable way, but there's no way to determine that. Okay, so you, um, thanks for taking my follow-up question. So you do anticipate an increased cost to the state judicial system and the county budgets? Because um, this the, the courts have made it very clear to this committee that they're underfunded currently and that they need more funding and more staff. When we were touring yesterday, they were showing us how there was someone working a job she doesn't normally work um, because they were short staffed. So are you, so you are saying you're aware that this would increase costs to an already underfunded department and you're okay with that? Well, I'm hoping that, I, I think it will have an increased fiscal impact. I'm hoping that the house passes a budget and I'm, I'm really hopeful that when, I, when the budget makes it to the Senate that there's adequate funding for the courts because beyond this policy, nothing's, and I've seen this, nothing's more frustrating than watching someone get paid $300 an hour to sit on the bench waiting for a case to be called. I, you know, as I, I don't feel that that's a good, attorneys are expensive and if you're paying them to sit there because it's overcrowded, I, I don't, that's, that's, um, that's not good money well spent. So if you can keep it moving along in, a, in an efficient manner, you have police that are waiting for their case to be called, there's court interpreters, there's a lot of negative uh, fiscal consequences of having an understaffed court. So I would, I would support uh, adequately staffing the court, not sacrificing public safety. Uh, Representative, Representative Sy oh, excuse me, Representative Murray first. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator, for taking my question. I actually just had two quick ones. Um, one, I was wondering um, if there was a reason for striking out the language 
relating to financial conditions for bail and pretrial detentions. And then my second question was if um, this bill coincides well with Senator Susie's bill, Senate Bill 252, or if they clash with each other. Thank you for the question. And the, the second part of it with Senate Bill 252, which I also support, and it's, I believe that's an excellent policy, they, they do not conflict. They're separate sections of the bail statute. And the section about the cash bill being struck out, there is another section um, in the bill chapter that specifically addresses the uh, cash bail. And, and if a person's being held simply because they can't pay their bail, they don't have the financial resources to do so, then there needs to be a written finding. That part is struck out because I don't personally, in my opinion, I don't think it's a good policy. Well, the person's been arrested a second time. Oh, we'll increase their bail from five hundred to a thousand dollars. I don't think that that's really a great policy, uh, in in the sense that you're just increasing the bail. That that has to do with whether they're going to uh, show up at the next court hearing. That's really what that's factoring in. So uh, that seems to be more of a punitive penalty by increasing the bail. This is strictly we're not we're not going to necessarily offer you bail because you keep or it's going to be harder to get bail because you keep violating the conditions. Whether you're on your personal recognizances or, or paid a cash bail, I don't th think is relevant to this policy. Uh, Senator, this seems like it's actually a, re <coughs> a relax. Excuse me, a relaxation of the present situation. Do I understand that if somebody is on released on bail and violates the conditions of bail, the police have the discretion to take them to the county jail immediately without a bail commissioner? It, so this is in fact relaxing that that uh, taking that discretion away, is it not? I think what this is doing is creating a clear policy of when a person violates the conditions of their release by getting arrested while released on bail already multiple times when it's going to be invoked and it's going to, I think there's an important important subject that doesn't always get talked about is consistency in how the law is applied this is a very clear policy of when it's going to apply you hear some people that get arrested a second time and they're held and someone else doesn't and they they make all sorts of theories why and rather than have that debate this is a clear policy it's it's not it's not subject to debate. It's very straightforward of when it would apply. So perhaps that when people say taking the discretion away, that's discretion does lead to some people to speculate on why there's you know statistics suggesting you know these laws are having a disproportionate impact on certain communities. Well, when there's a clear, unambiguous law of when a person's going to likely be held, I think that's a better policy for people to follow. I think it will be applied more consistently. Else. Representative Pro. So we just had a question of whether this was going to cost more or not. But in my head, and I'm asking you whether you agree with me or not. There's the question. Um, if they don't get released after the third time, and they've been known to go out five times, there's two more uh, arraignment hearings that don't have to happen because they're in jail until these other cases are taken care of. Would you agree to that? I, I most certainly do. To give an exact, you know, specific answer on what the fiscal impact would be, yeah. no way to actually determine that, but I think there's a lot of administrative and, and, and savings and, and community savings, especially on the law enforcement side and the court side, that get, often gets overlooked. And wouldn't you agree that community be, would be safer if that drunk driver was off the road? after the third time permanently until he gets addressed instead of two more times? And yes. Thank you. Um, Rep Representative Adams, I have a question. Um, do you have or a number of uh, any idea um, how often this would actually, I mean, how often do, do we know how people who have been arrested a fourth time while on a bail? Is, is there any examples of this actually happening? Well, I did give the, the drunk driving example. That was one. And that was, again, that was five times in a two-month time period. Uh, it does happen a lot, uh, you know, with uh, drug offenses. It happens a lot with domestic violence offenses. So you're dealing with people who, you know, it's not just the substance abuse. It's that that person is more likely to commit, you know, breaking enterings, robbery, stuff like that. So you have other high-level offenses that are um, 
sometimes the byproduct of untreated mental health issues. But at the same time, if we're not going to, if we're going to let the person out to their own peril, we're not necessarily doing them any favors. So there are some benefits of having a person in a crisis and not letting them harm themselves or others. So there is some other benefits of this policy. Thank you. Seeing no further questions. Oh, oh is there a side check again? Uh, I don't know whether this is in order, but if I may, let me say this. I am. I don't think I'm required here, but I'll, uh, under ethics, to say that I'm a bail commissioner. I will under the next bill, 252. But I'll say it anyway. I do. I've up to. I've done it for 22 years. I'm up to about 3,300 bails. I see one a year, of this. That is somebody violating bail conditions that have before their trial. I, about one a year. I can say, in my humble opinion, I've I've seen it not necessarily in courts in this state, but I've sat in courthouses watching multiple, and I've represented individuals who violated their bail by getting arrested for the same offense and managed to argue a successful bail hearing by having that person released again. So I've seen it happen several times, and I've heard about it happening several times, and I've read about it, and um, I would watch other hearings that I'm not involved in. So I've seen it happen, and not necessarily in the state, but it does happen. And, and I think having this policy this way uh, creates a clear policy, and it's happening more in some of the higher crime areas, specifically Manchester and Nashua is where this happens uh, more frequently, uh, high, higher populated areas. Representative Bolden. Thank you. Just one quick question. Um, I'm sorry if this was already covered, but can you speak to the first paragraph of the fiscal note where the judicial branch says that um, that the way that this bill is written is un um, unclear to them? That they don't know how to enforce it? I believe the uh, judicial branch will be here, so you can ask them that question since they, I don't think that he can really speak to that unless you can, Representative uh, Senator Abbas. So I think the, the problem is, is that the law, there is a rebuttable presumption on the existing law. It's just it's not being applied correctly or consist on consistently but it also the other problem you're having is even if you have that rebuttable presumption the law is not clearly expressing what happens in order for you to rebut that presumption what needs to be done and what would happen if you do or don't so even if you don't rebut the presumption people are being still being released so it, it seems to be applied differently uh, depending on where where you're getting your case heard I promise I'm not trying to drag this out. Um, so the if you look at the paragraph, they're specifically confused about how to implement um, when when certain activities need to occur. That they're, they're saying that they don't understand. I mean, they're here, right? So maybe they can just speak to that. But it seems like they're saying that they don't understand like which arrest. Um, and that it's specifically like a wording issue with the bill. I don't know. So what, what's explain. written there is they're not clear about what happens with the second offense. Does it, the second offense has to still be open. So if you, if you read the, this as it's written, so if there's probable cause to believe that a person, while on release pending a resolution of a prior offense, so you have, that's your first, right? Then if you go to the next part, it says they committed the felony, class A misdemeanor, or, um, or drunk driving, while released on bail. Thereafter, it was arrested for a third felony. So you're talking about your first offense. You've now been arrested two more times. So it says third offense. I, so I can't ex I'm not sure if you had to explain that any clearer. It's your third offense based on being released on the first. That's okay. We'll get the, the court. We'll explain what their thinking was. Um, Seeing no further questions, thank you, Representative uh, Senator Abbas. Excuse me. Thank you. Chair uh, calls David Rothstein. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is David Rothstein. Uh, I was a public defender for over 30 years. 
Um, I was one of the directors of the program, and I am now in uh, private practice in Exeter, focusing largely on criminal defense. And I'm here on behalf of the New Hampshire Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Having listened to uh, the senator and to the questions that the committee has already asked, I think really covered primarily the points that I was going to make. Um, so I'll be even briefer than five minutes. First of all, I, I do believe um, in response to a couple of, of the questions that the language uh, already exists in the present statute, uh, even with a second uh, offense. Um, and it, for example, the language in this present statute is if you are released on bail um, and there's probable cause to believe that while released you committed another offense, there is already um, the mechanism, the machinery to do exactly what this bill would, um, would call for on a second offense. So obviously it would be applied to a third offense or a fourth offense. So this statute has become very complicated with a lot of different provisions and a lot of different um, uh, permutations. And if, it, if the language already exists and is clear, uh, which I believe it is, I, I, don't, I don't see the need for an amendment. Um, on top of that, um, I would comment on the language issue uh, is one thing, but I, I, I have spoken, I think, to a, a number of familiar faces in, an, in another session. I, I think there are resource issues in, in this state uh, that are very difficult to get a hold of uh, and, a, and a grip on. One of the resource issues that I've heard before is sometimes a bail commissioner doesn't know the whole situation when somebody has been rearrested. So that's an, an information situation that has to be addressed um, at the local level. There's uh, J1, which a, a lot of people have access to in terms of getting information. Um, so that's, that's not an issue that this statute can address. Um, there are also issues on the setting of bail and getting enough information about the person that you have before you when you set bail. When I was here before, I talked about how short notice you have when somebody's rearrested. You have to hold one of these hearings. The prosecutor, the judge, the defense attorney don't know very much about the person. Um, if you have a county where there's pretrial services, where they can do an, an interview of the person before the bail hearing, um, like in the federal system, you get a lot more information about the person. They can run a record on the person. They can try to confirm some of their information. This happens in some counties. It doesn't happen in others. But again, that's an implementation um, issue rather than a language issue. And finally, in response to, uh, I believe, one of the, the questions, there is uh, a need for flexibility even in a repeated arrest scenario. Now, I have a different perspective on repeated arrests. From my perspective, if I'm representing somebody who's been uh, out on bail, commits one new offense, commits two new offenses, it's going to be very, very difficult from my perspective as a practical matter to get that person released again on bail. However, there are still individual circumstances to take into account. Um, if the person is getting rearrested for um, a violent offense, if the person is getting arrested for escalating offenses, the chances of them being released, and I know you've had an opportunity to talk to some judges, are incredibly, incredibly slim as a practical matter. However, most of the new offenses that people get released on are not violent. Mostly, you do not have the five DWIs or five armed robberies and people getting released and, and committing new offenses. It's usually attributable to substance use disorder um, and mental health issues. And to put people in jail for potentially a, a very long time is not the best solution. The jails are not outfitted to um, help people. These people are going to be released. The jails are not outfitted to get these people what they need so that when they get back into the community, they're less likely to reoffend. Um, in some counties, um, there is an active pretrial release program where people actually connect with the person and they figure out what they need and they supervise them in the community and they can get them into long-term drug treatment. They can get them into mental health treatment. The state is a, a great place, but it's so variable uh, county to county that in some counties, uh, like in Hillsborough County, our biggest county, where there's probably the most crime and the most serious crime, we don't have that type of program. Um, I think that, again, I think it's not so much a language issue as it is an implementation issue. And while I understand certainly the point that the senator made, quite a valid point, quite frustrating when somebody gets rearrested, I do think the language here already exists and the energy should be put into trying to develop 
implementation resources um, so that people are less likely to reoffend. And I'd, I'd be glad to take any questions. Representative Bolden. Thanks for taking my question. Maybe it's not in your wheelhouse. Um, I know that about half this committee represents Hillsborough County. Um, do you know if someone is in the example of five DUIs, if they're taken to county jail, are there um, services available at Hillsborough County for them? Yeah, Hillsborough County is historically, it's obviously the biggest jail in the state because it serves the biggest population. Um, historically, in, in my view, it is chronically uh, the, one of the least capable of uh, taking people in and providing them certainly pretrial resources. There is no pretrial release program in Hillsborough County as there is in Merrimack County, Stratford County, and I believe Cheshire County. I think I think a program like that in Hillsborough County would be would be fantastic if it existed. But you know, we're talking about we're talking about county government. I think I think it's very hard for you know for for a statute or for the state to force a county to develop these these programs. Representative Prue, you talked about the language is available at the second one. Yes. But it's not mandatory. It's correct? not. It's a. It, but it creates. It's not mandatory, uh, uh, Representative Prue. But I, I believe it's reasonably a mirror image of the proposed language. Except, I think you can do it the the second time as well. If you're if if it, as I read it, if you are on release pending resolution of a prior offense, and you commit a felony, class A misdemeanor, or driving or operating while impaired. There shall be a rebuttable presumption that the person will not be ab abide, and that means the result of that is if you don't meet the rebuttable presumption, then you can be detained. I agree with you that this third offense language is more directive, and I, I think the senator talks about the importance of trying to perpetuate a, a policy. I, I don't think I don't think that anyone, including the judges you 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 met, disagree with the fact that if someone comes on a second offense, a third offense, or more, that it's highly, highly likely the person is going to be detained as a practical matter. So I know in my city, it was a revolving door. So they weren't using the second one, or the third one, or the fourth one. So I think then I'm all set for putting a mandatory to the second one, mm -hmm. if I thought it would pass. Right. But I'm kind of like in the third at least the third one they need to be held and right and i understand there's other programs that they can go into and maybe being held they can get put into those programs would i agree <laughs> seeing none uh thank you oh wait oh, there was one. Uh, one. thanks for taking my question if if um if mental health and drug issues are are really the root cause of a lot of the the reoffenses that we're seeing, and we pass this bill, so we're in a situation where we're not only uh, holding more people pre detention, but a lot of the people that we're holding are problematic from you know from a drug and a and a mental health standpoint. You you said that there's a lot of variability uh, between the counties and how these cases are treated. What about the help that uh, somebody can actually get while they're behind bars? Um, can they get any? They, they, well, they, they really can't. I mean, I, I, I can relate a story I had with somebody who had serious uh, mental health issues, very serious mental health issues that rendered him um, incompetent. And the jail said, in terms of mental health issues, you know, we offer very limited, like, you know, once a week, they can talk to a counselor, uh, it's all voluntary. Their, their view on mental health is that if the person's mental health issues are not disrupting the facility, in other words, if they're not creating a safety concern in the jail, um, then, I mean, they really don't become proactive in terms of trying to involve that person in mental health counseling. So the person is, you know, is, is sitting in, in a jail. I think any of us, even those of us who hopefully have 
good mental health and don't suffer from from substance use issues would decline significantly if we were incarcerated, um, if we were separated from our community, and if we were um, probably already untreated when we enter the jail. The jails are the jails. I think do by and large a, a very good job at what they're designed to do. They are not designed uh, to serve the function of providing rehabilitative services to people who struggle with chronic uh, mental health issues or substance use issues. Um, I have heard that the jail, if you're in withdrawal, uh, I've heard it's just a terrible place uh, to, to be. Um, if you're trying, if you're going through the withdrawal symptoms and you're in jail, they just don't, they just don't have the resources. What they have done over time is they have um, been able to get into giving medically assisted treatment um, to people who qualify, um, and that can help some people. But mental illness is a real, uh, I mean, I think if you went to the jail and you'd talk to people, you would find just a stunning amount of mental illness, uh, substance use disorder, and also um, comorbidity, the two com coming together. Representative Newman. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Uh, my, my concern about this is the uh, taking discretion away from judges and bail commissioners. And one of my concerns is, according to the way I read the bill, <clears throat> all three of the uh, all of three of the offenses that they may have been bailed on could have been, I don't want to say low level offenses for driving while intoxicated. I mean, it could be they all did point one two or whatever the current level is, or just above that. Somebody that maybe has a problem, but not a really significant problem, and and has used misjudgment and got him, him or herself arrested a third time. Is there a potential here that we could unknowingly, unwittingly, and unwantedly um, affecting those kind of people who have not been convicted of anything, um, and more so even, or more people even, than how many are affected by the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh uh, offense kind of person? Um, I, I just believe that the judges and the bail commissioners, with the rules the way they're written now, have the ability. Do you agree with that? I, I, I do agree, Representative. I think that, that you know, we have to, by and large, trust the people who have um, the local knowledge, the people who are the judges, the people who are the prosecutors, um, to make those decisions. I think, by and large, they make good decisions. As I said, if I am going to court um, and I am representing somebody who's a recidivist uh, in this situation, uh, I'm going to do what I can as a defense attorney. My ethical obligation is to, if they want to be released, I'm going to try to argue for their release. I will tell you on one hand that that's very, very difficult to do if someone is a repeat offender as a practical matter. But on the other hand, I do think that amount of discretion um, is uh, is very important. And I do think we should trust the people at the local level to, to by and large, make those decisions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your testimony. And the chair recognizes Frank Knack from the ACLU. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Frank Kanak. I'm the policy director with the ACLU of New Hampshire. Um, we will have a handout for the next bill. I don't on this bill in part because we are still not 100% sure what the, what the bill is trying to do. Um, I think we heard um, the senator talk about the fact that this is um, really just trying to create after the third offense. But if you look, and I think there was questions about this, if you look at how this language is drafted, um, quote, the person shall be detained in pretrial detention based on a rebuttable presumption that the person shall be detained is new language that doesn't exist anywhere else that I've seen in the bail statute. So if you look at, for example, uh, the failure appear section, the rebuttable presumption is just that there shall be a rebuttable presumption, but not that the person shall be detained. And so this really makes us think that this is a backdoor three strikes law, completely taking judicial discretion out of the statute. And again, we're also concerned that the uh, PR bail option so that we are not having a two-tiered criminal legal system where people with wealth can pay for their freedom, where people without wealth cannot, um, has been stripped from this. Um, 
uh, just a few other things that uh, I want to touch on um, is, you know, as you know, we are in very uh, uh, great, really appreciate and, and huge support of Chairman Roy's addition to the budget around getting the funding in there to have a real time bill tracking system. Again, we've seen no data that there's actually an issue happening here with people being released. We've heard anecdotes, but we have no hard data. And so having this real time system in place would ensure that even anyone making these important decisions has all that information in real time so that if someone's being released and getting uh, rearrested, that person making that decision has that information in real time. We think that's an important step forward and one that does so without un unnecessarily taking anyone's liberty, um, just making sure that we have all the information in place. Um, again, and I, I, I imagine Pro Professor Sher will talk about this. But we also have to, can't ignore the fact that the data that he has collected shows that 36% of the cases that they looked at, the cases, the charges were later dismissed or null prost. And so this notion that, you know, everyone who's getting arrested is guilty, um, first of all, that's not how our criminal legal system works. And second of all, that's not how it's working practically in New Hampshire. 36% of the cases they looked at were later dismissed or null prost. And so the, the fact that people are going to be automatically detained and taking, having their liberty taken away is, is troubling. Um, and, and finally, I think just kind of getting back to the public safety angle, and again, we'll talk about this on the next bill, but there's a huge amount of research on this issue. And so when we hear individuals talking about the fact that we need this to increase public safety, the research says the opposite. So there may be specific cases, and that's why judicial discretion is important, while someone should be detained based on the specific facts in that case and letting the court make that determination. Having these blanket whole, uh, uh, rules that people shall be detained goes against all of the research on this issue because you're going to be pulling people away from their communities, their job, their responsibilities. Um, if they have childcare or they're caring for elderly parents, there's myriad ways that people, um, that the harms will just exacerbate if we're unnecessarily detaining people. And I apologize. We didn't have daycare today, so this is my son. Um, so I thank you and happy to answer any questions. Did your son fill out a pink card? Uh, I will have him do that. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, Representative Newell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Um, I was wondering, you know, a lot of what this sounds like to me is, um, you know, of course we're making it mandatory. And of course, to me, that reminds me of mandatory minimums. I would assume that that's kind of what you're talking about the research as far as when we take the discretion away and do that kind of stuff. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Um, you know, I won't you share my own my own story of the impact of mandatory minimums on on uh, my life, but uh, it was very very destructive as far as I'm concerned. And so I'm I'm curious, especially where that coincides with things like mental health and substance use. And uh, I'm sure you know from the ACLU you have probably a lot of information. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. You know that a little bit beyond what I was planning on talking about today. So I can definitely send you all tons of research on the harms of, of mandatory minimums in the sentencing phase, um, not in the pretrial phase. Um, but again, with that, you know, we saw that evolution really start in the early 80s and kind of perpetuate um, the, you know, the fact that we now are, I think, 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's incarcerated population, in part because of mandatory minimums and three strikes laws, um, and that we're seeing states across the country, including deep red states in the South, move away from that because they've seen that they have net harms on the community. And if, there were, if we're actually concerned about having safer communities, I'm um, ensuring that, you know, the vast majority of people are going to be released, that we're ensuring that when people are released, um, you know, we've had proper rehabilitation and we have proper services in place, um, that there's been a move away from that. Um, but in this pre, uh, pre-trial phase that, that we're concerned with here, um, it's, even, it's even more concerning because these people are not convicted of anything. Um, they're alleged to have done certain things. There's research that we have from New Hampshire that shows that more than one in three people will have those charges later dismissed or null prost. Um, and so we're concerned with kind of anything that takes away that judicial discretion for the court to look at all the facts, to look at the person as an individual and say, I think this person is a danger or a flight risk and detain them, which they have multiple ways of doing right now under the law, or to say, I do not think this person is a danger or a flight risk and therefore give them release. And as has been pointed out, there are multiple ways in the current bail law where people can be detained if they break their release orders, if a prosecutor disagrees with a, char with a release decision, there's myriad ways that they can be um, held. Thanks. Representative Bolden. <clears throat> Thanks for taking my question. Um, what is your son's name? Uh, Felix. I have a follow-up though. 
<laughs> um, hi, Felix. Um, as far as the you said that this sort of re-implements the three strikes law, I I think I understand that that's some um, Clinton administration concept. Do you know if there's any research into the concept of having three strikes you're out outside of like how it affects baseball? Um, I, I can definitely send you all lots of information on that. Um, actually, a lot of the origins of the three strikes laws, unfortunately, came from the privatization of our prisons. And so uh, the private prison providers, uh, CCA, GO, others at the time, were actually pushing these model three strikes laws across the country because it was good for business. Um, it was a way for them to ensure that they had more people in their beds. They actually, in their, um, um, uh, um, their financial disclosures that they were required to, to disclose way back, um, would actually talk about you know, their concerns with efforts to move away from this and how it was gonna impact their bottom line. Um, and so fortunately, New Hampshire, we have not gone down that route of, of private facilities, um, but that one of the major you know, origin and kind of the major pushes across the country of these laws not in the pretrial, but in the in the in the uh, sentencing phase, was uh, private prison um, facilities. Representative Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in this bill, and where where it says that um, while on bail, I'm just curious about personal recognizance and bail are. Would they be considered the same in this bill, or would somebody on personal recognizance get an extra strike, or how how, how do you think that would, might work? I, I don't think that there would be a distinction there. I think our concern here, though, is this, this is taking out PR bail as an option, so that you're going to so striking out that section so that people without wealth are now going to be detained because they're going to have cash bail that they can't afford, and so that people with wealth will just pay the fee and, or pay the bail and, and get released. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes uh, Chief Barfonsky. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you uh, for having me today. My name is John Brafonsky. I'm currently the Chief of Police in Bedford, New Hampshire, um, where I've been Chief for um, more than 11 years. I have 45 years in law enforcement experience. I'm currently the President of the New Hampshire Chiefs of Police Association. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, if the current bail system was working pr appropriately and properly, uh, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, Senator Abbas would not be sponsoring this bill today if the implementation uh, of the bail system here in the Granite State was working uh, to protect victims. That word victim, I don't think has been mentioned in this room for the past hour. Why aren't we talking about victims here? The victims of crime. The people that, uh, whether they're low level or not, if your loved one happens to be a victim of crime, it's not a low level offense. They're a victim, right? In the 45 years in my police experience, I can tell you without any equivocation that the majority of crime are, is committed at all levels by a small disproportionate number of offenders. That's been the axiom in the criminal justice system since I was an undergraduate in criminology and penology in 1973, 50 years ago, taught by the Commissioner of Corrections for the State of Connecticut. Disproportionate number of crime is, com the majority of crime is committed by a disproportionate number of offenders. Prolific offenders are responsible for the vast majority of crime everywhere, here in this state, as well as across the country. Included in my written testimony, there's a recent study that was completed uh, in Seattle where they implemented this system over a year ago uh, to focus on prolific repeat offenders. And lo and behold, what they found was that by doing so, they reduced crime overall in the city of Seattle. Another study, which is not included, but I can get it to you if you want it, from California, shows precisely the impact of focusing on repeat offenders that are continually released in the system over and over again who have reoffended. There's been a lot of talk about 
the percentages of crime and the percentages and numbers of arrests. Bedford, New Hampshire does um, approximately 700 arrests a year. Talking with my colleague, Chief Oldenburg, who's in the room, between uh, Bedford and Manchester, we arrest somewhere around the vicinity of 5,000 people a year. For Bedford alone, I've been a chief um, during the time when there's probably been over 70,000 arrests. And I look at each and every one, and I have done so for the past 11 years, and I can tell you that um, when we talk about the catch and release system, that's precisely what it is. It's become such a mockery that in the criminal justice system, the equivalent of a tank of gas or two bags of heroin gets you out of jail. And that's what happens each and every day across the state to the point where Manchester cops and Bedford cops, troopers and sheriffs know the names of these people. They know where they live. They know how many times that they've been arrested and they can tell you their criminal history like it's on the back of their hand. Why? Because they run across them so many times. This is a bill that focuses on prolific repeat offenders, right? You can draw the line at two, you can draw the line at three, you can draw the line at four, but the line hasn't been drawn at all because we're talking about people that are in and out of jail 12, 13, 14, 15 times. I know of one case in Bedford, at least 17 times, where this person's been arrested and released, uh, reoffending each time under bail conditions. It's past time that we take some action and to think about the victims of crime. The victims of crime, victims of crime. Can we think about the victims of crime once when we talk about these types of bills? There's people out there that are suffering each and every day at the hands of these people. I'm not talking about the retailers and the shoplifting crime that's perpetrated in Lowe's or Target or whatever. We're talking about the tradesperson that loses their life's ability to work when their truck is stolen or their tools are stolen or that some person is working three jobs to try to make uh, ends meet to put food on the table and the catalytic converter is, is cut off their car and it's a $2,000 job that they can't pay for. That's what we're talking about here. It's high time, past time, that we think about the victims of crime. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Noel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Um, I appreciate that a lot, you know, reminding us to think about the victims of the crime. My, my question, I guess, is, you know, the way that it sounds, there's already the discretion um, to be able to detain people if, if that's seen as necessary. So if there's something, but that would be at the discretion of the judge. And so my question is, are, is what you're saying that, that the judge is not considering the victims? The judge isn't considering the victims. The system isn't considering the victims because there is no consequence, right? Uh, yes, uh, that's precisely the fact. I look at every single minimus that comes from the Hillsborough County Attorney's Office to, uh, the man, uh, to the Bedford Police Department every single day, right? And the vast majority of those people are, are people that have been arrested and reoffended. In what world does it make any sense to arrest someone for failure to appear and then let them out again on an ROR and to reoffend? It's an axiom, it's true that the majority of offenders, right, commit a disproportionate amount of crime. And that's been true for many, many decades. We need to focus on the people that continue to reoffend. If we can do that, you will have less costs in the criminal justice system. You will have less resource costs uh, on the courts. You will have less costs uh, for um, the police departments and the prosecutors and the public defenders because these cases won't happen. And trust me when I tell you, offenders, if this law goes into effect and offenders know that they hit the third strike law, right, or the third strike and they're gonna go to Valley Street Jail, they're going to be thinking twice about committing that third offense. Thank you. Representative Sytek. Chief, uh, something's getting blurred here. We're talking about pretrial. The instances I see of long rap sheets are people who have committed a new crime after their previous has, crime has been adjudicated. Are you confusing, conflating two situations, one of pretrial and one of a new offense after adjudication? And I, I, it, this is, it sounds slippery to me. Well, uh, let me put some sand on the slippery slope. Uh, there is no conflating of the two issues. 
Well, I'm talking about people that we know that have been released on bail conditions, failure to appear, and other crimes that are continually out, reoffend, out, reoffend, and none of those cases have been adjudicated. It takes a year, year and a half, two years for some of these cases to go through. And some of the other testimony, when we talk about non -proce uh, no process, the vast majority of those no process that I get in Bedford are part of what we call the global plea. A certain crime uh, uh, that was indicted, for example, or a complaint is no process in favor of a plea to combine charges sometimes between two towns or two cities. So oftentimes the people that we arrest happen to be the same people that are arrested in Manchester, and then there's a global plea in, uh, in Superior Court where the Bedford charge is non processed in favor of the other charges in Manchester. So be careful when you look at numbers, because numbers can be deceiving. Chief, isn't it true that even within one town, um, several charges can be null processed in favor of one particular charge that is pled to? 100%, that's exactly what happens. Representative Bolden. I understand your concerns about um, people who are being victimized. Um, is it not the case that many, if not most, of our drug laws in New Hampshire are misdemeanors, which would be included under this legislation? And wouldn't we be capturing people with this bill who need drug treatment and maybe aren't being arrested for victimizing anyone um, other than destroying their own lives. Was the baby that just died in Manchester a victimless crime? That was a drug crime. That's not a victimless crime. Um, so let me answer your, let me answer, uh, uh, answer your question. We would love in law enforcement to have services in every single jail, in every single county in the state of New Hampshire, where people that are arrested for property crime, who have an underlying substance use disorder, could get treatment. The study that you're seeing in Seattle shows that for the vast majority of people that are released, they don't seek treatment. That's a fact. The vast majority of people that are released don't seek treatment. But if they're arrested, and if they have an underlying substance use disorder, and if we had effective programs, and there are effective programs that are out there that cut recidivism significantly. The Maine State Prison, Maine just introduced a, a medically assisted treatment program in Maine in their prison system a couple of years ago that has shown pretty good results. If we had that in our county jails, right, we would have an opportunity to address this particular problem. Whereas when people are released, they go back to reoffending and they don't show up at treatment. Follow up. I'm sorry if I put you on the defensive with how my question was worded. I think what I was trying to get at was, would, would you object to changing this, the wording to be more specific about um, the types of offenses that would apply um, so that we're not capturing people who would be at a disadvantage if they're incarcerated, um, seeing as it sounds like, at least in Hillsborough County, it'd be extraordinarily difficult to access treatment um, while incarcerated there. So my question is, would you object to making changes to specify um, criminal offenses that in actually involve victimizing others? Yes, I would, because those are the people that are sticking up uh, the convenience stores on Pine Street, right? Those are victims. Uh, and so uh, we start drawing the line and a squiggly line and gerrymandering different crimes. We're not getting the effect that's necessary. There needs to be a strong message from you to, the, uh, to these offenders and to a strong message to the victims of crime in your, cons in your uh, constituencies that this has to stop. Chief, the, the crimes you talked about, the uh, property crimes, um, you know, the stealing of the tools, the catalytic converters, is that not most of the time to, to, to uh, pay for their drug addictions? Is that not the, the origin of those crimes most of the time? A lot of the level property crime, yes, absolutely, Mr. Chair, uh, is a result of substance use disorder. And the fact of the matter is, is that when those people are released, right, without any effective treatment, right, despite the fact that there are bail conditions, they continue to reoffend most of the time to support their substance use disorder, right? But where we have programs in place, Rockingham County, I believe, has a fairly um, uh, 
well-run program that addresses substance use disorder in their jail, and it's effective. But if we release them, we lose control over the ability to make sure that they get the treatment that they need to stop the behavior that society believes is not what they should be doing. As a follow-up, what is your experience with our current drug court system? My experience is, is that it's not very effective. And the reason why it's not very effective is because, again, there's no consequences, right? Um, if there's no consequence um, to not adhering to the conditions uh, by which the court sets, then the individual continues on a path and a trajectory um, that is consistent with what brought them there in the first place. So I would say that while drug courts may be effective, they need to be coupled with a more effective program of um, services as well as a more effective program of treatment to the extent that if the individual who violates the terms and conditions set by the drug court judge, then the next step has to be a confined treatment program uh, in a facility. That will cost money. It will cost a lot of money. But at the end of the day, it's going to be less money than what's being suffered each and every day, each and every year by the victims of crime in the Granite State. Thank you. Representative Newell. Could I just ask a, a really quick clar clarify, uh, clarification? Uh, because you mentioned uh, medically assisted treatment. I was, um, I was very involved in changing the rules around buprenorphine, uh, commonly known as Suboxone, um, and so that it's easier to uh, prescribe and access and things like that. And we did hear when we were going through our orientation that um, from the Department of Corrections that it, that's a very helpful thing that's going to be implemented in the state prisons, and I'm just uh, on the state level. And I'm just curious when you say that uh, you know medically assisted treatment, you're talking about in Maine. Are you saying that in on the county level, uh, there is not necessarily access to medically assist, assisted treatment such as buprenorphine and things like that? Um, anecdotally, do I have proof in front of me? No, but my my sense is is that there are uh, insufficient effective programs, whether they're medically assisted treatment programs or other programs for people in jail um, that have an underlying substance use disorder, okay, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I apologize to any members that had further questions, but we do have to move this one along. Um, the chair recognizes uh, Professor Scher. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Buzz Schur. I'm a professor of law at UNH Law and a elected police commissioner in Portsmouth. Uh, my opinions today are mine only. They're not those of UNH Law, UNH, or the Portsmouth Police Commission or Police Department. Um, let me address uh, a few things that have already been said and then get to the point of my testimony. One, uh, bail is can be in three different forms. It can be personal recognizance bail, PR bail. It can be cash bail, where you need to put up an amount of cash. Or it could be corporate charity, where you need to put up some sort of security and pay usually about 10% of, uh, of what your bail is. So those all count as bail, be it bail or whether it's called bail or PR. Um, uh, I've said this before, and I'm going to continue to say it because uh, it, it, it rankles me. The term catch and release is a term that refers to fish. It does not refer to human beings, and to talk about human beings in terms of catch and release is inappropriate and offensive. Uh, all the people who are involved in the criminal justice system, including those who are charged with crimes, are actually human beings. Um, and have complicated lives. And so we need to respect all of them, whether we like their conduct or not, and whether we approve of their conduct or not. So um, I, I, I will continue to make that point as people continue to use that term. Um, the chief statement that there are no consequences for drug court and problems in drug court is just flat out wrong. Um, I recommend that this committee talk to 
the judges, the superior court judges who run drug courts and find out that there are consequences if you fail in drug court. Drug court does involve requirements of treatment, of counseling. That's the whole point of drug court, to deal with situations in a way different than just sending people to the state prison and letting them further descend into uh, repeat crimes uh, in the criminal justice system. That's the whole idea behind drug court. And uh, I would ask the chief, if he doesn't understand that, to talk to Chief Justice uh, Neto of the Superior Court, who has managed drug courts for a number of years. Uh, they are very effective. If only we could have more resources to deal with them. Um, Finally, on the issue of null pros, uh, to uh, address something the chair brought up uh, of having several charges uh, in one town uh, and them getting null pros for, for, uh, in return for a plea on one of them. The documents that we looked at from the court system, they're called case summary sheets. Uh, if an incident leads to a number of different charges, they're all on one case summary sheet. And so if there's a plea to one of those charges or to a lesser of those charges, that would be reflected on the case summary sheet. So I don't think it's the case that the huge majority or even a small majority of the null process that we saw in 36% of the 504 cases we looked at are because of plea bargains. You know, I've talked with uh, the public defender program about that. I've talked with a number of lawyers. There's just a lot of overcharging, uh, and 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 there's no way around that. Um, part of the overcharging is because the system in New Hampshire is not well designed for a lot of consultation between prosecutors and police before the formal charging happens. It's a back, more of a back end system than a front end system. Uh, and so uh, I, I think you end up with a good bit of overcharging. Um, so I, uh, as this committee knows from my testimony and other circumstances, I care about actual data uh, and I think this committee needs to make decisions based on real data, not just anecdote. I don't think it's, it, it makes sense for this committee to uh, decide what to do with this bill based on the five DWI example. That's a rare occurrence. The, the, there, there's several issues in terms of a lack of data. One, there is really, I think, in reality, in the bail system, two, two separate categories of people uh, identified uh, in the current system and the, uh, the, the proposal by Senator Abbas. One, those who commit felonies and are out on bail and uh, are then charged with another crime or a third crime. That group of people, as uh, Attorney uh, Rustein testified, that just not very frequently are those people going to be released on the second offense, let alone the third offense. It's just not very common. The only reason it's common, it, it, the only reason it happens, is if because a prosecutor doesn't bring a motion to revoke bail on the original felony. Uh, some of you may have read an, an uh, editorial, an op-ed piece I wrote in the Manchester Union Leader about a really tragic homicide case in Manchester where the individual was out on bail on an attempted first-degree assault. Uh, he committed an, another misdemeanor in early August and a set of misdemeanors in later August, early September. In neither of those instances... Uh, did the the, the uh, did the courts set bail that re re resulted in being held, and he then is char later charged with uh, killing somebody. In those two court in the court hearing where those two s misdemeanor sets subsequent to the first degree assault bail release, the prosecutor didn't even bring up the fact that the defendant was out on first attempted first degree murder bail. 
The problem with that circumstance was not the bail statute, which is completely capable of holding that person after those two sets of subsequent misdemeanors, but the prosecutor in each of those misdemeanor sets didn't even bring up that he was out on bail on attempted first-degree murder. And second, the prosecutor on the attempted first-degree assault didn't move in that case to revoke bail because of the two subsequent misdemeanors, sets of misdemeanors. So that's a prosecutorial favor, failure. And I think with the felonies, um, where somebody's out on bail on a felony and subsequent offenses are occurred, uh, they're either getting held or prosecutors are just not bringing it to the attention of the court. Not a failure of the bail statute, a failure uh, of, in that instance, prosecutorial behavior. The second set of crimes that's kind of buried in the current statute and, and, and the changes is Class A misdemeanors. Now, Class A misdemeanors can be shoplifting, can be disorderly conduct, uh, can be petty crimes. Uh, under this statute, if you commit three, if you are out on bail, on PR bail, on a petty crime, a disorderly conduct, kind of yelling in public, uh, and you do that two more times uh, uh, before your original charge is arrested, this would automatically mean you go to jail. I don't think we want this to work that way. That's more of a street sweeping bail statute than it is something to deal with uh, real issues. Um, more importantly, let me go back to my notes, um, we don't know how many of the first kind of uh, uh, felony followed by two subsequent arrests, how many of those are, there are out there. Whether the problem that uh, Senator Abbas uh, and the chief and others describe is a really significant problem or not. We just don't have any data. Uh, and we can't make, keep making decisions without data based on this, based on anecdote. Um, what's left out is really telling. Uh, what's left out from the way the statute is now to what is proposed are two things. One, the language that uh, you, can't, you can't hold somebody based on a financial condition without the court determining by clear and convincing evidence that there's no reasonable alternatives. The true failure, bar any other comments that have been made of Senator Abbas's proposal, is it's unconstitutional. U.S. versus Salerno says if you're going to hold somebody without bail, as Senator Abbott's proposal recommends, regardless of the circumstance, you have to have a hearing. He has to be, the individual has to be represented by counsel, and there has to be a burden that the state has to prove by clear and convincing evidence that they are dangerous. You can't do it with just a rebuttable presumption. It's unconstitutional. Um, and, and I think that's the fatal flaw uh, with this bill. Um, I'm, I think I'm almost done. Uh, last, I think slowly but surely we're making progress on the issue of bail and bail reform and how the system should work. I know uh, Representative, Representative Harriet Gathright has had a proposal for uh, magistrate judges, and that was turned into a, a study committee, which is making its way through the, the, the legislative system. I'm very optimistic about that. I know represent the chair has, uh, has gotten into uh, the budget a proposal for funding for a real-time bail situation. So prosecutors know when they look at a person arrested for something, whether immediately, not days later, but immediately, whether there is a, uh, a pending, whether the person is already out on bail. Those developments are very promising. And I know a number of 
uh, bail bills arising out of the House have been retained in hopes of having a collective gathering and 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 uh, process of sorting out what adjustments that we can what adjustments can we make to the bail system with all the stakeholders present in that discussion, not trying to deal with it by one bill offered by uh, a senator, another bill offered by a representative, another bill offered by a senator, you know, individual tweaks here and there. Let's look at it as a package. Let's have all the stakeholders with roles in the system. And I think, um, I think this committee has done great work in hearing from more and more people in visiting jails and visiting the court system. I think that is the way to approach this, and we've made more progress in thinking through how to reach good solutions without knowing exactly what the right solution would be by the efforts that have been made by Representative Harriet Gathright, by Representative Roy, uh, by this committee in retaining bills. So I encourage this committee to retain this bill. Uh, looking at the time, I'm not sure I'm going to be here for the next bill. Uh, you have heard my thoughts uh, in terms of this, this the, the uh, Senator Susi's bill, which is very similar to uh, uh, Senator Bradley's bill of last year. Um, you've heard my thoughts. You've, you've all received a copy of my study um, that is ongoing. I will point out that we continue to increase the number of cases we look at. I think we're, we're over a thousand now. We're seeing no appreciable change in, in the results of that study. Um, so um, I have strong hopes that if this bill and the subsequent bill is retained, we can have, we can really think well with input from everybody uh, how to manage the concerns such as they are with the bail bill as it currently exists. Uh, thank you for listening to me once again. Oh. Representative Mannion. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, you mentioned us talking about the data, so um, this question is about the data. Of the 504 cases that you cited and was also mentioned by the gentleman from the ACLU, of those 504 cases, how many were on a person who is out on bail two times prior for felonies, class A misdemeanors, or DUI charges, then gets arrested a third time for a similar offense had all of those cases null prost? We could not uh, look at that because we were limited by the case summary sheet we were looking at, and the case summary sheet only has on it those which the person is charged with in that incident. So it's an incident by incident case summary sheet. It doesn't include in it other subsequent or previous charges from other incidents. So we have no way of, and we have no way of tracking that through the case summary sheet. So I, I can't answer the question. I'd like to answer the question, but that's too complicated uh, a data collection thing, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, so that data would not apply as far as this bill is concerned. Uh, yes and no. Thank you. Uh, no, be, uh, yes, uh, it would apply because some of those were foundational charges. It might have been the first felony uh, that would count under this bill or the second one or the third one. We just don't know that one way or another. No, in that we can't track it as you described. Representative Prue. So I'm not a big data guy, but that sounds like flawed data to me. If you can't answer all those questions and see all their previous record and what's pending on them, that's not data. Oh, it, it, it's data for what we represent it as. We don't represent it as a comprehensive study of, uh, of the kind uh, Representative Mannion. Uh, I, and I, when I testified to that study, I represented it just as what it was. And I appreciate that it's not 
perfect data. It doesn't uh, it doesn't um, capture uh, everything that's going on in the system. But uh, to be fair, Representative Pru, I did not represent it as a complete picture of what's going on. Um, the problem is, and this is for this committee and other committees to solve, if they want true data, complete data of the type you want is you need to spend millions of dollars to to uh, so the court system can purchase a data collection system which software system, which they don't have, then we could get the data that we all want. But that has not happened yet. I've, I've, you know, for five years, I have been arguing that we need to do that to no avail. Follow up. So you're asking me to make a decision on this, on your flawed data. No, uh, one, I disagree yeah, yeah. with you uh, on, on it being flawed data. It's not flawed in what we represent the data to be. I'm not asking you to make a decision based on this bill, based on that data. I, I raised the issue of the study because it had previously been, been uh, raised by one of the uh, prior witnesses. Representative um, Jambrin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, I found it very interesting when you said that a person that commits a petty theft would be subject to this bill. This if bill, it's charged as a Class A, yes. Well, I just looked up the statute. If it's less than $1,000, it's a misdemeanor, and that means that the prosecutor has the wherewithal to charge it as a Class B. And you also said that... Um, it would be unconstitutional because they weren't they didn't have representation while a class a misdemeanor requires representation under our constitution so how do you square that uh what i said was if they didn't have representation and the burden of proof was not clear and convincing the, you need both of those things uh the the statute proposed by, the amendment proposed by senator abbott's eliminates the clear and convincing standard of proof. That's what's unconstitutional about it, uh, number one. Number two, some prosecutors choose to charge uh, a petty theft as a Class A, some choose to charge it as a Class B. Many prosecutors choose to charge it as a Class B so the person won't have counsel. Thank you for your testimony, Professor. And the chair recognizes Attorney Head. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ms. members of the committee. My name is Richard Head. I'm the Government Affairs Coordinator for the Judicial Branch. Um, judicial Branch has no position on the policy of this bill, um, and that's not the point of my comments today. I did want to address um, one of the thought, one of the issues that was identified in our fiscal note, which was um, an ability to interpret um, some of the language in the bill. And I've spoken briefly with with Senator Abbas about this. As you run through the bill, it it, it, it it's essentially a three strikes bill. So in the first part of it says if there's probable cause to believe that a person while on release uh, pending resolution of a previous offense committed a class A misdemeanor uh, or driving or operating while impaired. And then it goes on to say was released on bail and thereafter was arrested. It does not repeat that same language about release pending resolution of a previous offense. So it simply says, essentially, on the third offense, thereafter, after the first two offenses, without tying, without affirmatively tying it to the other two offenses and the status of the other two offenses. In our fiscal note, uh, we wrote that we assumed that both of those prior two offenses um, had to still be active, essentially, at the time of the third arrest. Um, and, and based on, on Senator Abbas's testimony, I believe that was the intent. It could be resolved by simply saying where it says, and thereafter on line 13, while on release pending re resolution of the prior two offenses, essentially reincorporate that language into the bill um, would at least help clarify that ambiguity. 
The other issue um, that creates some level of ambiguity is that all of these rely upon knowledge of the status of bail at the time of arrest. And as, as has been commented on, um, based on some of the work that Chairman Roy has done, there is work that's, that's um, going forward, hopefully, that will provide some information about the status of bail when the bail is, is, uh, is issued. What happens, though, is that bail can change over time or that a case is resolved at a certain point. Um, and that, I don't believe, would be tracked under that system. It's essentially a snapshot of bail at the time bail was issued. Um, and then thereafter, you know, an individual, the, the status of that bail may not be reflected in that same system it in the same real time. And I, I honestly don't know the answer to that, whether it would or wouldn't, but I think that's a, a somewhat more complicated system. And as has been noted, we do not currently in the judicial branch keep a real time database that is available to law enforcement at the time of arrest that would give the status of bail at the time of arrest. Um, we do rely in, in terms of a, of a court proceeding on the prosecutor to bring forward the status of any uh, prior offenses that an individual is is being presented to a judge uh, as it relates to a, to a hearing um, before a judge. So I just want to make those two points, but make clear we do not have a position on the on the uh, policy of this bill. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Bolden. I'm sorry, Terry. I just have a lot of questions. Um, thanks for taking my question. Are you? I feel like what I'm hearing is, and I want to know if, if I'm understanding you correctly, that it's possible, like it's within the realm of possibility, to be, um, if this passed, to be incarcerated um, for bail violations after the case has been resolved for which you were under. Um, bail conditions like do, am I making sense it sounds like because of the limitations of data and tracking cases that you could be um, in trouble for violating bail conditions that no longer apply you know I think so thank you for the question I think it's more likely to occur the other way which is a person um, would not be held in detention because the time of the third arrest they may not know the status of the other two bail uh, proceeding. So I, th I, I, I think the risk is greater in the other direction, which is um, the person would not be detained on the third rest because the, the, can, the status of the prior two arrests may not be known at the time. Thanks for that. That helped me understand a lot. So it's not that someone might go to um, jail when they really shouldn't. It's that they won't go to jail when they should at, under the current status of things. I think that's the, the more likely scenario based upon the lack of information about the status of bail at the time of arrest. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what, what you were just talking about, that, it, that the information would not be available, um, do we need to fix the information problem so that the judges and the prosecutors and uh, whoever has the discretion makes better discretion than trying to jerry-rig the law around all the time to cover all the consequences and maybe catch people, and I'm not going to use the rest of that analogy, um, that have never committed a crime and they've just got three arrests and they, according to the way we have now changed the law, they get caught in that situation. Do you, does that make any sense to you? Um, yes, so thank you for the question. And I think, one, I think the chairman has taken a significant first step towards getting information. Um, I do believe having that level of, of immediately available information to law enforcement at the time of arrest is an important aspect of, of the system. What it would take, though, is a considerable level of resources, both in terms of um, technology that would be at the court system and communicating outside of the court system and uh, unfortunately personnel because uh, there are a large number of bail decisions being made daily and 
and to be able to input bail decisions into a system immediately such that it is thereafter immediately available takes human resources to be able to monitor bail decisions as they're being made in real time and input that into a system in real time and then have that system immediately accessible. And it's a, a, it is a complicated, certainly a doable, um, but it would require a large number of human resources and, uh, and technology that we currently sort of wouldn't be able to implement immediately. Thank you. Representative Selig. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just want to make sure I understand the full implications. So if I were hypothetically a young college student during pledge week who was not of age to drink alcohol, but got myself very drunk. Hypothetical. Hypothetically, hypothetically, right. Um, and and during this pledge week, then got arrested for drunk and disorderly behavior as a result of my pledge choices. Um, and then the next day was out with my pledge people again, and this time as part of my pledge activities, committed shoplifting of something of value. So I've now got a second offense that fits within this criteria. And then on the third day, um, perhaps Representative Tenazar has gone back to being a police officer, a state police officer, and sees me, you know, running through traffic on I-95 in an inebriated state and takes me into protective custody. This is to starting stop me. to sound like a RICO case. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've now got yeah. three offenses within one week. And would that then necessitate, based on the way this law is written, that I be held in jail because I would obviously not have been capable of adjudicating any of them yet? Uh, so thank you for the question. So I'll make a couple assumptions. One is that the first two events resulted in um, class A misdemeanors being charged. The third offense would at least um, initially, uh, I think the way I would read this result in in a detention hearing, it does not require that detention be the permanent solution for that third offense. It says simply that there's a rebuttable presumption uh, that the person would not be able to abide. So in that third instance, um, hypothetically, you would be explaining to the judge how uh, how you would rebut that presumption of uh, of not being released. Thank you. But so if my third offense was something that would still classify as a class A misdemeanor or one of these others, would that then put me in this situation? As I read the bill, it would put you in the position of having a rebuttable presumption, but there is a presumption of pretrial deten detention, but you would be able to rebut that. Representative Jambrin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I understand bail has several stages. You could be bailed prior to the trial, after the trial, and a finding of guilt. Uh, you're also bailed until you're sentenced. And then after you're sentenced, until you surrender to the House of Correction, you'd still be considered under on bail. Is that correct? I think that's right. I'm not, this is not, it's, you're exceeding my level of, of knowledge. I did not practice criminal law, so I, I always get a little bit uncomfortable when I get into a, a, too much of a detail. I, and, and follow up. Uh, the reason for my question is, it's worded that while on release, pending resolution, uh, would we not consider the resolution to be the conviction? I think that is an interpretation of it. Thank you. Representative Newell. Uh, Representative Prue has been waiting. Go ahead. Thank you. In your opinion, listening to Representative Seeley on a three-day spree, Perhaps she should have been held on the third charge before she went out and crashed on the fourth day. I won't comment on her hypothetical. Oh, <laughs> sorry to put you on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question, Mr. Ed. My, uh, I'm curious, you know, yesterday, of course, we had a, a wonderful little presentation about um, the drug courts and um, also mental health supports. And I know that, you know, when we're talking about these type of cases, a lot of the time, you know, as we've established in this hearing, um, you know, it, it very much overlaps with substance use um, uh, issues and mental health issues, right? Um, so I, I was wondering if you could just kind of uh, clarify a little bit for everyone, maybe people who weren't there yesterday, what the state of um, mental health support is, because I think, you know, we are seeing 
seeing drug court expand, but I think you know we're we're still in the process with mental health supports. Am I right? Um, so thank you for the question. Yes, I mean, um, so two parts. One is is uh, I do appreciate everyone's uh, attendance yesterday at, at attending court and also the the presentation. I know some of you were not able to make it. If the committee and the and the chairman um, would like. Uh, Judge Neto to present to the full committee at any future event, by all means, please feel free to reach out um, and we can arrange that. You know, any aspect of when we're dealing with drug court, mental health court, and criminal uh, cases in general, there is, in a large percentage of cases, a mental health aspect to, to the case. Um, and within the drug court system it is uh very actively tied towards treatment and that necessarily involves mental health and drug addiction issues um based upon just the the, the close tie between between the two um but that said in terms of a mental health court we are at very early stages of being able to develop protocols and systems where there's a science-based uh, uh, protocols that can be implemented to have an effective mental health court. Um, and that is something that we are actively working on, but is behind where we are in terms of the drug court implementation, which has been a very successful um, program. Doesn't mean everyone graduates from it successfully, but it means that within the parameters of the program, we're having a great deal of success. And, and even within that context, the use of punishment and reward is a very delicate balance in terms of ultimately achieving success for the, for the persons that are involved. And the degree and the nature of the punishment can ultimately affect whether or not there'll be a successful outcome in that drug court proceeding. And it's and there is a great deal of science-based um, uh, processes that are being implemented in that system that we're starting to work on through mental health issues, uh, but, but a, a much more complicated and, um, and, and not as, as common in terms of, of how courts are, are addressing it. But we are starting down that process and that road, but we're a ways away from having a, a well-implemented mental health court system. Representative Sue Newman. Yes, thank you for taking this question. Several times there have been comments about data collection and how useful that would be. And I wrote down a data collection software system. Are you aware of any states anywhere in the United States that do have a good working system? Um, so thank you for the question. I've not um, gone out personally to, to evaluate what other states are doing in terms of collecting bail data. I suspect there are um, systems that are, that are available to do it. It's not that it is not possible to do. It is the level of resources we would have to add into our current system to be able to do it. So it's not only the technology, but it's also the human resources to be able to ensure that we are keeping data because data it doesn't get generated automatically. Somebody has to be putting it in and it has to be data that's useful and then ultimately can be available to, to those who need it. Um, and that requires uh, a human being to sit in and, and in real time input data into the system uh, on the status of bail. And that, that just requires in, in essentially every court somebody dedicated to being able to do that. Um, and we currently don't have that that level of resource or the technology to implement that. And then it also has to communicate with in real time to an officer who's on you know in the street. And we do have some information that does do that. And and the question is trying to add an additional sort of level of information and data that's not currently in the system into that system. And and it it just requires time, technology, and and human beings. And money. And money. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's on my A great deal of money. list. <laughs> um, so you no know, further questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on this bill who has not testified on this bill? Seeing none, I hereby close the public hearing. And um, 
if anyone's here for the executive sessions, I just want to give you a heads up. We're probably not going to do those. I'm going to end up opening and recessing them to next Wednesday. So put it on your calendars. If you're here to testify in the next bill, um, I know you've been here a while, but we are going to take a 10 minute bio break and we'll be right back.
this point, we're going to open the public hearing on what's the next one called? On SB two five two, and the chair recognizes Senator Susi to introduce her bill. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. For the record, I'm Senator Donna Susi. I represent Senate District 18, comprised of the town of Litchfield and five wards in the city of Manchester. And I'd like to start my testimony this morning by first thanking you and each one of the members of the committee. Um, I know the previous hearing was a long one. I know the issues are difficult, but I truly appreciated being here to hear the very thoughtful questions and discussion around this super important issue. Uh, there are some things that I certainly took away from the discussion and from the questions that were asked. Uh, I have a stack of file folders in front of me. They actually all relate to the issue of bail reform. And I say that because I have been involved, though not directly in the initial uh, legislation or the study committee, but have been involved in the issue for a while. And I think what much of the testimony you heard on the previous bill um, should show is that, contextually speaking, bail reform, the first piece of the legislation, was introduced with a primary goal of ensuring that an individual doesn't sit in a jail simply because they don't have a dollar in their pocket. And I think that still is one of the most important goals, that finances alone should not be the reason that someone is stuck in jail. But I do think that certainly um, many of those who spoke before me sort of outlined what the system is that this new bail reform legislation, new five years ago, um, was placed upon. And that is a system that unfortunately is very inconsistent, that doesn't fully collect all of the data. And I, you know, I had forgotten that the, the good representative, Representative SciTech, um, has been a bail commissioner, but I, I do think that we created a system for the right reasons, for good reasons, but that we didn't have the infrastructure to support it. And by that, I'm not criticizing any of the individuals that serve as bail commissioners or the court system, but there are a myriad of differences between what happens when someone is provided personal recognizance bail in Hillsborough County versus in Coas County or Sullivan County. Um, we know that the bail commissioners um, are not mandated to have training. We know that many times the bail commissioners go without any compensation. Um, we have a number of things that I think are very important that we need to reflect upon. I think there's some great work being done. So, you know, heard earlier with the study committee that Representative Harriet Gathwaite uh, introduced, I think, Representative Roy's initiative to ensure that there are more resources are all very important. But none of these things are going to happen at once. These things have been systemic for a while. And I think if we sort of step back and look at that, there are some discrete things that we can do um, to ensure that we're doing our job as legislators. Um, a couple things I do want to comment on uh, that were also said earlier. Um, professor Scher was one of my law professors. <laughs> he's not just a law professor, he's a great law professor. Um, and there are several things he said that I actually agree with. Um, but I do have to say, even he acknowledged the system in New Hampshire um, is not well defined. It's more of a back end system than a forward end system when it comes to the engagement and making these decisions about whether or not somebody should be out on bail. Um, he also talked about the data, and I know many of you had questions about the data. Um, his, 
his data is limited in scope, the scope of data that's available, um, but it's not a complete set of data upon which we can make decisions. And I think that's something that we can all agree on as well. So this bill, a little different than the previous bill, uh, this bill attempts to, upon arrest, identify certain crimes for which someone should be held pending appearance before a judge. So instead of going before a bail commissioner for, and you can see on page one, beginning on line 24, for the crimes that we've delineated, the individual would be held pending the appearance before a judge. Now, you may hear that this is going to leave someone incarcerated for days and days. Well, I would argue that there, I can't argue that there won't be one or two or a couple of instances where because a crime is committed on a Friday night and because weekend days are excluded because the court isn't open, someone may have to wait. But what I will tell you is that given the volume of some of these potential cases, given the potential for a magistrate system, given other things that this good committee is working on, um, I think this makes sense for the times that we're in. I know you're being uh, given a lot of different options as to how we might rework this statute, but I think that also speaks to the fact that maybe we do need to look back at what we did five years ago and fine tune it, not throw it out, but fine tune it. And I think this bill is a very discreet way that we can do that. Um, I also want to speak to you uh, about the issue of, or the term, anecdotes, because you are going to hear some anecdotes. You are going to hear some stories of where someone fell victim to a crime, uh, then someone was apprehended for that crime, and some very dire things occurred as a result of it. Um, I think there are people on, on both sides. I think there are victims. I also think that we have to be mindful and respectful in creating a process that recognizes that someone who's been arrested is innocent until proven guilty. That is our system. Uh, but we also have to keep public safety in the forefront of this discussion as well. You know, in the Senate chamber, um, that room was used for the Supreme Court at one time. And as a result, if you look between the windows on the top, there are scales of justice. And those scales are about balance, are about weighting the factors and how we as legislators are going to craft laws that weigh those important factors of justice. And I just want to say that I think the current process um, has left some people um, out in the cold, so to speak, um, particularly with respect to victims. Um, I've spent a lot of my time as a legislator working on issues particularly surrounding domestic violence. I sponsored the domestic violence law that created, it was called Joshua's Law, that created the crime of domestic violence. And I know for a fact, although the chair beside me is empty, if I could have actually brought someone with me whose story I've heard, um, I know that they would have told you that there are crimes today that are going unreported because of fear that somebody, the alleged perpetrator, could be released. In a situation of domestic violence in particular, that's critical. If somebody is afraid that if they report a crime, if the person living in their home, remember somebody who shares a relationship likely living in their home, um, is going to be released immediately, they fail to report that crime, I think that's that's sort of weighing the scales in a way that, that really does give me pause and that really does concern me. Um, I think on a lot in a lot of our cities and towns, and as I said, you'll hear some anecdotal information, but remember each anecdote includes a victim, and every alleged crime, whether a person is convicted or not, still uh, includes a victim of that crime. Um, I think the word has gotten out that our system is just tilted a, a little more in the wrong direction for some of the people in our state. 
And although I received great training as a lawyer, and I do practice labor and employment law, I'm here before you as a state senator who's heard many real stories from my constituents um, about the impact of the law we passed five years ago and about the need to make some very discreet changes to it to ensure that we are treating victims and perpetrators fairly and that we are ensuring the safety of the public of the state of New Hampshire. So with that, I will conclude my testimony. I'm happy to take any questions. As I said, I know that the chief from Manchester is here, can certainly speak to some specific incidents about this, um, this particular bill, the impact uh, that the initial bail reform has had and how this bill might help with that problem. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Seeing no questions, thank you for your testimony. Oh, thank I'm you. sorry, Representative uh, Sidek. I just wanted to see if anybody else had a question. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a, a brief comment and a question for Senator Susi. since it's my only chance to see you. Uh, we, I pay attention, I'm a bail commissioner. We, yes. In Rockingham County, I want you to know, based on what you started your testimony with, that the bail reform originated with not keeping people in jail only because of poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't do that. In, I talk to the people in Rockingham County. We don't do that. And nobody's ever mentioned Rockingham County. It's always Cheshire or Sullivan, but never mm -hmm. Rockingham. We don't do that. That's my comment, which is thank you for listening. My question is, how'd you come up with this list? Um, this list actually was worked on um, over a couple of years. Um, this list appeared in legislation that um, passed the Senate before. I should note this bill passed the Senate on a 21 to 3 vote, but the list was a bipartisan collaboration. Senator Bradley had similar legislation previously. Mm -hmm. I picked up on this legislation and we were attempting to determine some of the most serious offenses for which there should at least be a pause and careful consideration about someone being released on bail. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. The chair recognizes Senator Abbas. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Senator Darrell Abbas. I represent District 22. It's the communities of Pelham, Salem, Atkinson, and Plasto. That's a joke between me and one of the representatives. I, I'm testifying in support of Senate Bill 252. And I just want to point out, we had a hearing on 249, and they're very different policies. And if you look at the vote in the Senate, they're, they were different numbers. So they're independent of each other. And I just ask to give each one fair consideration, because this policy, I feel, deals more with a specific narrow issue there's a list of offenses, and those 12 offenses, what they all have in common, are two, there's, two, there's two major things. One, they're a violent crime where the victim is a person. So we're not talking about property damage, even breaking and entering. We're talking about a crime where the, uh, the victim is a person, and it's a violent offense. We have domestic violence, stalking, those type of, those type of charges. Or it involves a sex crime involving a child. That's the other type of offenses. For those 12 offenses, if someone is charged with any of those, the only change in policy is they'll still have a hearing where they can be held. They can assess the dangerousness of that person, but they're going before a judge. They will not be released uh, through a bail commissioner. That is not, we're not targeting bail commissioners. We're not saying that the law is not being applied correctly, but what we're looking at are some of the more egregious unintended consequences of bail reform and trying to address those without repealing the whole thing or, or reverting back to the prior system. So this language may seem similar to the members that were on the committee last term. We've we had a, this policy before us. One difference is, is that we separated the bill into several, several bills, and the reason for doing that is that if you, perhaps if you're not in support of one policy, you can still support the other rather than have one big bill. 
And that was the strategy that I, I thought may be better suited to perhaps address some of the problems. There is a glaring hole in the procedure and in the law because yes, the state does have the opportunity to challenge that person's release if they are released by a bail commissioner and can request a hearing if, if the state believes the person's dangerous. However, if that person has already been released by a bail commissioner, in, in theory, the court could still hold the person after the dangerousness hearing, but that dangerous person has been released into the public for uh, 48 hours. So, so that's the hole in the procedure. If the state wants to ask for that hearing, it, it seems that it should be asked before the person's released. And they don't even have the opportunity to do that because the person that practices, a person will waive their arraignment if they're, given, if they're awarded bail by the bail commissioner. So I think we're dealing with specific public safety concerns. And, and just an example of some of the, what I say, egregious unintended consequences. There was a person who was arrested for domestic violence. They were released uh, within a short time, within two hours. That same night, uh, went to that person's house, broke into their house, and then committed a felony level sexual assault on that person. Same victim, within 24 hours. It's an, and domestic violence is a type of offense that tends to elevate, and that's there's plenty of statistics showing that it may start as a misdemeanor offense and elevates. And that's a, one of the most obvious examples of seeing that. But that person was given bail without even appearing before a judge. All we're saying is that this person will be brought before a judge. I understand that there's a, an a, initiative to perhaps convert to a magistrate system. I believe this is a safeguard to take into consideration until that system's put into place. Because as you can see, the bail procedure is very complicated. It's a long chapter, and there's a lot of procedural steps that can be taken, whether it's a magistrate or we remain in the current system we have now. But in the meantime, we have glaring public safety concerns that need to be addressed. This, a deal, this deals with that in the short term while we perhaps work together to put together a magistrate system. I can't stress this enough. Public safety, when you're talking about violent crimes with the victims of people, and crimes, of, violent crimes or sex crimes against children, those are, those are as egregious and as bad, of the, worse of an offense as a person can commit. These are the most dangerous of the da most dangerous. And I, I feel that if that person is going to be granted bail or be released, it should be go before a judge and the, the state should have the opportunity to seek the remedy or seek the bail that they see fit. But keep in mind, the state does not is not required to actually ask that the person be held. They can waive that. They, so it's not mandating that anyone be held on bail. The state would still have to meet their burden of proof. There's two different processes we may co come across. If a person is in, is indicted for an offense, uh, the common the common practice of that is it, it could be the result of a longer investigation that went into that, and. That I can imagine that the, the prosecutor would be in a better position to meet their burden. But someone who's arrested on a Thursday and they're there first thing in the morning, that prosecutor better have their information together. They're going to have a tough time meeting that burden. That's, that would fall on the, on the prosecutor for not being uh, prepared for the hearing. But at least they have the option, pro the discretion to ask for it rather than the person be released and we take our chances and see what happens. I think given the level of offenses, this is not an egregious policy. I hope the committee would support not to pass. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Representative No. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question, Senator Abbas. So in the last bit, in the last hearing, what we had heard from uh, Professor Scheer was that um, that one would be unconstitutional. Uh, and what I wrote down, and I may be lacking a little bit, I didn't get the, the, the case written down just in time, uh, but it, it, uh, there must be a hearing, representation must be provided, and the burden is on the state to demonstrate that the person is a danger to the public. And so when I'm reading this, the court shall order that the person be detained pending trial. Of course, it talks about how there will be a hearing um, pending trial if the court determines by clear and convincing evidence, which I'm pretty sure that's what he was saying needed to be demonstrated. That would be putting the burden on the court, that the person uh, release of a person is the danger to the public or themselves. So I just wanted to clarify, essentially what this does is this removes um, what was, what was a, uh, barrier in the last one, this one satisfies those constitutional uh, necessities. 
in respect to the constitutional question, and let's leave it that this is my opinion alone. So in that, in 249, there, when we had that policy last term, there was discussion in, in consultation with the Attorney General's office, other people in the legal community, was if that said clear and convincing evidence, all you're trying to, in that scenario, all you're doing is trying to demonstrate that state is demonstrating you've been arrested. So whether that says probable cause, clear and convincing evidence, or beyond a reasonable doubt, the bottom line is to demonstrate the person's been arrested two times thereafter, after the first offense, being released on bail, we're not talking about anything more than their criminal record or perhaps the arrest report. So the reason why it says probable cause is that that's the arrest standard. If we change that to clear and convincing evidence, the court would be required to make two separate written findings. And that would, one being, it, I would, don't believe is a good use of resources because regardless of the burden, it's you're demonstrating have they been arrested for more than one offense. And if you ask the person, if the person wishes to testify, they can, they may state that they may state that for the sake of, yes, I've been arrested. Here's my charges. They're open charges. It's public record. With that, with that being said, the clear and convincing evidence standard, my understanding is that that Salerno case, the holding was limited to the interpretation of the current of the bail chapter that, that it was before the court. And it's not necessarily binding on that policy so this says clear and convincing evidence but here you can only have one offense and you're going to be held pending trial because the assessment is whether you pose a danger to the public safe to the public or to yourself it can also take i think salerno also talked about it being a flight risk where 249 the analysis is well you keep getting violating your conditions of your release now it's a that's a different analysis because we're saying we've given you bail and you didn't abide by the conditions on more than one occasion here you can have no prior criminal record. You can have no, nothing pending before any court, and now you've been arrested, and the consideration is, well, should you be held without bail? But whether you're held under 249 or you're held under 252, there's still the speedy trial law that it's a constitutional right, but it is defined in an RSA. Uh, if you are being held, I believe the case, and I was actually in between my testimony, I was actually, that's what I was doing over there reading about that, is... If you're being held, they will, the court will expedite your case and give it priority over someone who's not being held because of that constitutional issue. Because the speedy trial analysis is, well, by not getting your speedy trial, have you suffered any prejudice? Well, if you're being held or did, awaiting your trial, I could say that that's a pretty clear what that's a prejudice. If you're not being held, it's much harder to demonstrate that you suffered a prejudice. I think... And, uh, you know, I, I just want to clarify it, so, so correct me if I'm wrong. The The difference is in the, uh, you know, the, the difference is what is the standard, what is the constitutional standard for when someone should be deprived of their liberty, when someone should be detained um, and, and not able to, to move around freely or whatever. So, I mean, that seems to be the difference for me. So if it's an arrest, which is simply an arrest, and that person could be released uh, after that, that's one burden. Right. And then what we're talking about here is the burden for whether they should be um, detained until they have until trial. Right. Yes. But the one of them is is the burden is clear and convincing evidence. But the state's arguing or trying to demonstrate you are, pose a public safety threat to yourself or to the public or in, in Salerno, it talks about it being a flight risk. When it comes to the conditions of your release, that is completely different because you may not pose a danger to the public at all, but you're not abiding by the conditions. Conditions of your release can be several things. One can be that you submit to random drug and alcohol screens. Uh, one can be that you remain sober. Uh, th those are con One can be that you submit to a mental health evaluation, and especially if these are agreed upon. And if a person doesn't abide by those, well, again, what is the consequence of not abiding by your conditions? But that's a different analysis because you're not necessarily considering whether they're a threat to the public or whether they um, are a flight risk. It's the violations of the conditions. Thank you. Representative Sytek. Uh, <clears throat> Senator Abbas, I have a couple questions concerning, if I may, concerning this list. As I heard it being described, it was the abuse of a child or the actual physical molestation. 
do you see that the safety of the public is involved is it threatened under possession manufacture distributing of child sexual abuse images blah blah however repulsive that may be i don't see where how do you see tell me how public safety is affected by that immediately first of all i would give i would I, if you want to sponsor an amendment to remove the child pornography provision i'll let this committee evaluate that but i would, the supreme court and they've ruled on this and this is the Supreme Court of the United States, that when you're in possession of child pornography, the mere fact that you support the market, the industry, that in and of itself is harm to a child. So you may say, oh, I'm not harming the child because you know, I'm only watching the video. Well, you're supporting the market where that child was harmed, and that video never goes away. So that child's still a victim. Whether you're the, the physical actor or you're, you're supporting it, that's what the Supreme Court says, so I stand by that. Well, you've answered my question. Uh, the second one is this, in the bare bones anecdote that you talked about, would the judge have, uh, with respect to the woman Polonius that sold all that, would a judge have done anything different, given your bare bones recital, than issue a no contact? Assuming that, that the domestic violence arrest was the first offense, again, you have to take into account the individual factors, what, does that person have a criminal record? Have they been convicted of other prior domestic violence offenses? Do they have a restraining, active restraining order? There's a lot of other factors that can be taken into consideration when assessing whether someone is a danger to themselves or public safety. Uh, in this case, that would not have happened be, simply because the person would have been held and brought before a judge. They never went before a judge. They were released by a bail commissioner. And then would a judge made the same conclusion? I cannot answer that. I'm not. I'm not clear if the um, if the prosecutor would have even asked for asked for that person to be held. But what I will point out is, in this scenario, the, was the evaluation even made by the court to even consider? It it was never went before court. And consider it a cooling off period. Someone committed a violent offense. Do we want to release that person right away? Or do we want that person brought before a judge? It could be, again, if it's a repeat offender, I think it's worth having that hearing and let let the county attorney decide what to do if they want to go forward with it and let the court make the determination. I have one question. Yeah. I, uh, good to see you before us today. I just had one question about the hours, 24 hours and 36 hours. Is that enough time to get together uh, a judge, to bring people before a judge? Thank you for the question. That time period is, is consistent with the circuit court and superior court rules. It was taken right from there. So anyone who has an issue with those rules, I mean, uh, that's I don't want to take credit for you know supporting that. That language is already there. So I think it's important with any policy to have consistent language. And this, this stays with that. Thank you for your testimony. Chair uh, recognizes Alan Alden, oh, oh, Chief Allenberg, sorry. How about now? Well, there I am. All right. So I, like the chairman said, I'm Alan Aldenberg. I'm the chief of police uh, for the Manchester Police Department and have been so for approximately two and a half years. I sit there today in support of Senate Bill 252, and I'll, again, I will be brief. Um, overall, uh, crime may be down, but crime types that are significantly more harmful to the community are up. The types of reoffending, right? The types of reoffending while on bail are alarming. The inability to hold offenders, some offenders, results in greater harm to the community through more victimization. There is now no deterrent effect to arrest. Bail reform was passed without adequate pretrial services, so there was no oversight of offenders who do bail. Others that you've heard from today will state that crime is actually down since bail reform began, and therefore there is no evidence that the changes to the law have made New Hampshire less safe. 
The fact is, yes, overall crime may be down in New Hampshire. However, that is an oversimplification of what our communities are really experiencing. And many of you here today represent the community that I serve in. This is because different crimes cause different harms. A proper assessment includes detailed analysis of certain types of crimes to understand true changes in crime since bail reform began. Since bail, since bail reform began in Manchester, we have seen simple assaults increase by 6%. Theft from buildings increased 145%. Theft from motor vehicles increased by 16%. Thefts of motor vehicle parts and accessories increased 38%. Credit fraud, credit fraud increased by 15%. My highest priority is violent crime and the reduction of it, and a key, indica key indicator we access is gun crime. Since bail reform began, gun crime in Manchester is up 10% and was up 40% year to year for 2022. Gunfire incidents where an actual gun was fired is up 18% 18% since bail reform began. Fortunately, our relentless efforts on this problem is seeing some success, and we've been able to reduce non-fatal shootings by approximately 40% in 2022. It is no coincidence that these increases have occurred since bail reform began. The lack of ability to hold prolific offenders pending trial increases reoffending and absolutely makes our communities less safe. The type of reoffending we are seeing in Manchester is alarming. From April to December of 2022, again, just from April to December, we had over 700 arrests where the people reported to us at a time of arrest that they were out on bail. Again, that's just from April to December. I'm not going back from, did not have time to go back from January to April. So in that time period, over 700 arrests where the arrestee was out on bail for a prior offense. Nine were arrested for robbery. Nine were arrested for burglary. 32 were arrested for weapons offenses while out on bail. 18 were arrested for aggravated assault while out on bail. And one was arrested for murder while out on bail. I could go on and on, ladies and gentlemen, anecdotal, but I'll give you just one. Um, had one individual in the city of Manchester arrested for two counts of simple assault, released on an unsecured bond, arrested again, seven days later for another count of simple assault, stalking, in violation of bail conditions, domestic-related. Arrested again on 9-13 of 22 for a counter resisting arrest, released on PR bail. Arrested again on 9-16 for one count of falsifying physical evidence, a Class B felony. One, possession, one count of possession of a controlled drug, a B felony. And again, violation of bail conditions. He was held for four days. Bail was then set at 500 PR. Arrested again on 928 for one count of stalking in violation of bail again. Released on $1,000 PR. Arrested again on 106 for one count of armed robbery. One count of felon in possession of a dangerous weapon, Class B felony. One count of receiving stolen property, a B felony. Fraudulent use of a credit card. And one count of, one count of falsifying physical evidence, another felony. Billed by the court. Unknown what the bill was, because um, we're not able to find it in their system. To the gentleman's point, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize, I forget your name, but the he's absolutely right in regards to our ability to track bail accurately um, is a real problem, and the gentleman is uh, absolutely right in his comment on that. Uh, arrested again um, on 1226, again, another B felony, released. Finally arrested on January 30th of this year, um, after being after several capuses were isu issued out of Hillsborough Superior Court, um, after being involved in a pretty significant pursuit in a fight with my police officers in which uh, at least one or two were in, uh, injured as a result of um, dealing with this individual. So for those that, you know, I think people, and I don't think you people here do this, but People tend to minimize the victimization when it's not really in their living room or it's not in your front yard. Um, and once it becomes reality for people, those are the people that I get phone calls from when they're a first time victim. And they say, hey chief, what's wrong with the system? Why wasn't this person not held? And it's hard for a, it's, it's not hard, but it's my job um, to explain to my constituents, many of which are yours and 
explain the difficulties of the bail and the bail system and to have those difficult conversations with these victims and to get them to understand the process is sometimes difficult and it's not their fault. Um, so again, I urge you to uh, support this bill. I think it's a good start. I think it's a compromise. Um, am I in support of the previous bill? Yes, I am. Because the quality of life is Im impacting your constituents that represent the city of Manchester. And if you think it's not, um, I encourage you um, to reach out to me come in and do a ride along and I'll take you around the city and I will show you where um, your repeat prolific offenders are impacting the city of Manchester and the quality of life. Because our people in this state in particular, uh, in Manchester in particular as a, a state as a whole, deserve better um, from this body and law enforcement just wants to be part of that solution. So thank you for your time, I'll take your questions. Representative Sytek. Please pardon a little defensiveness on my part, but I try to do a pretty good job. And I've listened to your list of incidents. There were at least two where the, the arrestee was violating um, stalking. That's a problem with the court. That a judge had to let him out. No, Nobody can release a stalking, a repeat stalker, except the court. Is that not true? That's true, sir. And I would—I wasn't attacking. I'm not attacking bail commission, sir. I work with them for the last 27 years. Um, it's a very difficult job. It's a thankless job. Um, I think sometimes they—I know they do the best they can every day when they come in, um, and they're often, oftentimes presented, um, you know, with minimal information, have to make very difficult decisions. Um, is there a problem? You know, quite frankly, you know, I think from county to county, court to court. Um, where a person appears, um, the circumstances are going to be different. I don't think, to your point, I think there's a lack of consistency across the courts in regards to who's released and who's not released. Um, are, are you and I going to fix that? No. Maybe for a judge someday, but probably not going to happen. Representative Jamron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chief, for taking my question. It sounds like in that particular case, um, something failed. Now, was it the law? Was it the justice that, that uh, set bail? In your, in your opinion, I, I value your opinion. You've got a lot of experience. Who do you think uh, could have prevented that from going any further? Overall, um, to be honest with you, probably, probably a judge. Um, in recognizing the escalation of behavior. Um, obviously, I laid it out over a short period of time. Um, very violent individual that was, you know, had potential to kill somebody. Um, I would say that, you know, a, ju a judge should have recognized that. Now, you know, to Professor Shear's point, um, yeah, there are times when, you know, prosecutors don't make the appropriate argument. They don't, re they don't re reach the bar. Um, that could be for a lot of reasons, or they don't make the argument. Um, so it's a really, it's a combination of, you know, the total system. Um, I'm hopeful that answers your question, sir. You no know, further questions, thank you, Chief. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Chair recognizes Frank Knack. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. My name is Frank Kinnack, Policy Director with the ACLU of New Hampshire, here in opposition to HB or SB 252. Um, uh, so the handout has a lot of the information I'll be referring to, including in the, um, the, the appendix to the handout. Um, uh, but really just want to focus on the, the basic fact that we've all talked about before, that again, the current bail statute provides myriad opportunities to hold any individual 
if they violate their conditions, if a prosecutor disagrees with their lease order, et cetera. There are multiple ways that someone can be held. And the beauty of the current statute is that it's individualized. It takes the individual who comes before the bail commissioner, before the judge, that person can look at that person's facts in that case and determine if that person is a danger or a flight risk as the constitution requires. It is a system uh, that has functioned well. Um, and when we have heard concerns with the existing system, these anecdotes, when you actually dig into the anecdotes, as Representative Cytac pointed out, the, the facts don't match the anecdote. So in the case of stalking, where it wasn't a bail commissioner, it was a judge who made the order. Again, under this, under this proposed bill, the, the individuals are not going to be held pretrial indefinitely. They're going to be held for a couple of days and taken away from their lives until they get before a judge. They're just going to miss the bail commissioner. Um, and so in that case, again, that person could be released. So in the case um, of um, um, uh, Representative Sytak uh, mentioned, we also heard earlier in the Senate testimony on this bill, when this bill was originally introduced, the big uh, anecdotal case that they were relying upon was the horrific murder in Manchester, which happened um, uh, last year. Um, and so when that murder happened, um, uh, again, it was a frontal attack on bail system has failed. Um, and it wasn't until when Professor Schur, who, who um, had to unfortunately leave and, and can't testify on this bill, but I think he'll be sending you notes, when he actually dug into that case and looked at the facts in that case, where it became clear that it had nothing to do with bail commissioners, it had to do, it had nothing to do with the courts, it had to do with prosecutors not doing their job in multiple uh, in instances in to lead to that person to not be held. Um, so again, using that, it, that anecdote was the anecdote that we were going to repeal bail reform with until the facts came out. Again, we heard another anecdote here, but when we actually look at the facts behind these anecdotes, it's all too often that the facts don't match the rhetoric. Um, and so we're deeply concerned that we would be repealing an entire section of uh, bail reform based on these anecdotes that are, that are kind of paper thin when you start digging. Um, we also heard the chief uh, talk about, I think probably assuming what, what we had testified in the past, that we were going to talk about reductions in crime rates in New Hampshire. Well, that is an, un, uh, you know, an undeniable fact. Since bail reform in New Hampshire, crime, we're talking about Group A crime. And so just so you know, our source for this, it's the Department of Safety has great um, crime records data. Um, so we took the Department of Safety's information from 2018, which is the year of bail reform, through 2021, which was the most recent year of full uh, data available. Crime overall in Group A crimes, which is all violent offenses and the majority of other offenses, is down 18%. Um, in Bedford, where we heard the chief uh, testify on the last bill, Group A crimes and arrests are down 21 over 21 percent. In Manchester, Group A crimes and arrests are down. Group A crimes are down 13 percent. Arrests are down 33 percent. And so, while there are absolutely going to be cherry-picked opportunities to say, well, in this case, crime has gone up, it's gone down drastically over the past four or five years since bail reform uh, in New Hampshire, in Bedford, in Manchester. Um, and so I'm not going to sit here and say bail reform is the reason that crime has decreased. That would be disingenuous of me. But the, the fact that others are trying to argue that bail reform has somehow undermined community safety is, again, not backed by any actual facts. Um, again, we also heard public safety, and I talked a little bit about this in the, on the last bill. But the fact of the matter is, when you actually look, if we really care about public safety and we actually look at the impact of carceral approaches pre-trial, the data is absolutely crystal clear, decades of data on this issue, that holding people pre-trial, unless there's individualized determination of dangerousness, is actually a net harm to the communities because it's gonna pull them out of their community. It's going to increase their likelihood of recidivating down the road because they have been pulled away from the community, from their job, access to employment, et cetera. Um, and finally, um, you know, there, we have great opportunities to actually look forward and to strengthen the bail system. So uh, Representative Harry Gathright's bill to move towards uh, potentially studying whether it would make sense to have a magistrate system or some hybrid magistrate bail commissioner system, whatever that might look like, and actually taking time to look through that. Uh, Chairman Roy's uh, work to get the funding into the budget around real-time bail tracking system. Those are concrete steps that we can take to ensure that we have a bail system that is stronger um, versus this, which is an anecdote-based uh, attempt to, um, uh, which will result only in individuals being held unnecessarily, potentially thousands of individuals every year 
Um, and so from ACLU's perspective, the cost savings argument is less important to us, but also, you know, we're talking about 1.5, I think, million dollars just on the state level for the courts. That does nothing to talk about the fact that we're going to be spending 105 to 125 a day to jail and all those individuals, which would be an unfunded mandate on all of your localities. Um, particularly, um, I think it's important from a cost savings, from an ACLU's perspective, from a cost perspective, because we do know things that will actually improve. If we really care about public safety, housing access is connected to public safety. There's reductions in crime when you have better access to housing. Um, there are multiple ways that if we really are concerned about public safety, that we can be investing those dollars to actually make our communities safer. Um, so happy to take any questions and really appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Representative Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Knack. We heard a lot of different statistics today. I'm just wondering if you could address what Chief Aldenberg said about crime is down, but the specific crimes that are hurting people, whether it's property crimes for the catalytic converters or, or, mm -hmm. or whatever um, else the chief had said, he said those were up despite crime being down. I wonder if you could address that point. Yeah, definitely. So these, this is what the sheet looks like if you go to the Department of Safety's website. So this is Manchester, for example. So all the Group A offenses by offense type and then uh, reported and cleared arrests and um, for adults and juveniles. And so you can definitely go through here and cherry pick a few where crime may have gone up slightly. Um, but overall, and particularly for the more serious offenses, crime is down substantially in Manchester, in Bedford, in New Hampshire overall. Um, and so I, I'll go back and look at what the specific, uh, I know he, I think he mentioned like three or four uh, crime types. So I can go back and look through that. Um, but I could also, you know, quickly cherry pick a number of other specific offenses where it's gone down substantially. Um, I think it's important to look overall at the data and then to look at trends. Thank you. Representative Muse. Thanks for taking my question. Earlier, we heard Senator Susi talk about how a large part of why we're in the situation we're in is really a failure in infrastructure to support, um, support the current law. Um, I guess my, my question is, this particular bill doesn't attempt to address those infrastructure issues at all. What it attempts to do is to change the law. Um, from, a, from a constitutional perspective, and I know one of the things we're always very cons we're always concerned about the rights of victims, but I think we're, we're also very much aware of the power of the state uh, over an individual who might find himself or herself in one of these situations. From a constitutional perspective, um, does a bill like this pass uh, pass muster? Is are we still being as protective? Uh, when it comes to the rights of individuals as we need to be if we if we pass a law like this without actually addressing any of the same the infrastructure issues i guess i'm concerned that the kind of infrastructure issues that are making the current statute um uh occasionally fail um I, if we're not addressing them as as part of this are we really are we really helping or are we just sort of opening up a constitutional bag of worms. No, I, I definitely appreciate that question. And, and to give a little bit of context to, the, to my answer, um, you know, I, I think it is somewhat frustrating um, the monopoly that I think certain um, uh, folks think they have over certain terms like victims. And so from my perspective, you know, before in this role, I was working, I worked for the Montana Innocence Project and so worked directly every day with people, including folks, two folks who had been held incarcerated for 23 years each for a crime that they didn't commit and that the police knew they didn't commit on the front end. Um, and so it is, you know, dealt with um, both, both of them and the trauma they faced, their family members on a daily basis, talking to them regularly about the trauma that they faced, not only, you know, being separated from their family, but also having a loved one who was accused of a heinous offense that everyone should have known on the front end didn't happen. Um, and so, again, it, when we heard from Professor Schur, 36% of these cases are uh, dismissed or null pros, and I think, you know, there may be a few where um, the plea impacted that. But again, we're assuming that all these people committed the offense when the facts are 
possibly very likely that not a, a good chunk of those folks didn't do anything in the first place um, or were over drastically overcharged. Um, but getting to the constitutional question that you asked, you know, the Supreme Court has always been clear um, that individuals, there has to be an individualized determination, there has to be a finding of dangerousness, and it has to be a finding at a clear and convincing level. Um, and so again, we have concerns with blanket opportunity, blanket holds like this would have. So, um, you know, there's definitely some question here about how this would, because this is holding just before a judge, not all the way through pretrial detention. Um, so being transparent, I think there are some factors here that might weigh there. Um, but I do think that there's serious concerns here from a constitutional perspective. Um, and again, the, the, I think our concern with this as well, the bigger picture concern is we are just wholeheartedly considering you're, this person charged with this offense is going to be held regardless of the facts in that case. Um, regardless of whether, you know, as you all often know, when prosecutors get the case file, they could be like, oh, this is way overcharged, I'm gonna reduce. So that ignores all of those facts um, that we are just going to blanket hold this whole set of people and do so at a time when we have absolutely no hard data to show that there's actually any problem and that this is actually a solution. And when we do know the facts are clear that there are myriad ways that individuals could be held right now and that the, for whatever reason, be it prosecutors not doing their job, whatever, they're not being held. Um, so we have you know, all these concerns. Mr. Connect, can I ask you to stay? Uh, I can't believe the help police held somebody years that knew he didn't care. But that's not a question. That mm -hmm. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Chair recognizes David uh, Rothstein. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Rothstein. Again, I'm here uh, on behalf of the New Hampshire Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. I am not going to uh, repeat uh, comments. Um, I basically just wanted to state my, I think what I have said before, is that the, the best approach on bail continues to be a totality of the circumstances approach, which would consider certainly the nature of the offense. Absolutely. As a bail commissioner, as a judge, when you hear there's a certain offense, you, you raise an eyebrow, you focus in. If it's aggravated felonious sexual assault or if it's disorderly conduct uh, on the street corner, you, you, you have a much different perspective. You have to look at the offense. You have to look at individualized factors, as I believe Senator Abbas said, and you have to look at the offender. A couple of comments on um, this list, which other people have commented on. It starts with homicide. And it includes, which is obviously uh, w the most serious offense under our criminal code. Um, it also includes um, misdemeanor uh, domestic violence or stalking offenses. It also includes second degree assault offenses, which I had done some prior research when I was with the public defender. There are many second degree assault offenses that are overcharged. And when you look at how they ultimately resolve, they resolve as misdemeanors with no time once everybody has a chance to look at them or even lesser. Um, so to treat a, a, a homicide offense in the same sort of sequence of crimes as some of these other offenses seems to me to be uh, improper. If you think about homicide, the average sentence that a person is going to get in a homicide case in New Hampshire is about 30 to life. The average sentence that someone is going to get on a first-time domestic violence offense, uh, if the case goes to prosecution, is going to be a suspended sentence with the opportunity to potentially participate in some counseling. The case analysis in a homicide is also very, very different. A homicide is being brought by the Attorney General's office. Uh, the cases are typically extremely strong. Uh, they typically either go to trial where the person is found guilty after trial of first or second degree murder, or where there's a plea to something like 30 degrees to life. These other types of cases, the, the domestic violence cases, the second degree assault cases, the case analysis is very, very different. Uh, we talk about this as being a, a back-end um, system. If you look at the back-end, those cases do not tend to get um, significant jail sentences or prison sentences. They oftentimes don't even result in felony convictions. I think that there are some people charged with aggravated felonious sexual assault who absolutely should be detained pending trial. I've had some of those clients. I had a Manchester client who was alleged to be a serial rapist in Manchester. He was detained 
pending trial. We had a trial. He was convicted. I've had other clients charged with aggravated felonious sexual assault where perhaps it's a delayed report from many years ago. Uh, the client has no criminal record. The client has no reason to have any contact with the alleged victim. And that person is released on bail, and the case, the case goes forward that way. Um, so again, I do think you have to look at individual circumstances. Armed robbery um, is on this list. Um, I, I don't think there are too many bail commissioners who are going to look at somebody charged with armed robbery uh, with a weapon and who are going to just say, hey, you know, PR bail, um, we'll see you at court. I think that type of offense, the, the system is working. That type of person is not going to be um, given a, a, a PR bail as a typical matter. Um, I, I don't think the system is broken. I think that even 24 to 36 hours in jail can be a very, very significant period of time um, for a person, a very significant interruption in their life. And as far as the permanent detention goes and being driven by the offense, um, I do agree that courts attempt to give priority to incarcerated cases. But if you check with our superior courts, they're scheduling even incarcerated clients out several months um, for trial at this point due to the volume of cases that, that exist. Um, so in sum, I, I, I don't, I understand um, the very eloquent comments that were made in support of this statute, but I respectfully disagree that it's necessary um, and I'll take any questions if there are any. Representative Broads. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanna make sure I, I, I'm understanding this. So when Senator Susie testified, she made it adamantly clear that that this is affecting uh, the crimes where the victim was a person. Yes. Right. So what you were just saying was about you know the disruption in someone's life because they're they're now being in, they're in prison. I'm sorry that they're being detained for possibly two to three days. Right. But those are crimes that there is a victim, which I'm thinking safe to assume that their lives are probably disrupted for more than two to three days. So is there a difference from what you're saying than what she was saying? I don't think so. Um, I, I think that what I'm saying, I'm obviously talking about it from a, a different perspective without question. I'm talking about it from the perspective of, of the offender. I appreciate that these are, um, what, the, what these crimes have in common is that they all involve victims. They're not, they're not property crimes. Um, what I'm saying is you, you still have to look at the nature of the offense and the offender. I mean, a homicide is very different from um, a domestic violence simple assault or from a domestic violence stalking offense. It, they're just very different offenses. They're very different offenders. It may well be appropriate to incarcerate somebody um, on a first offense domestic violence or to hold them for that 24 to 36 hour period but not as a blanket matter, I think is all that I'm saying. Um, and I think that in the case where a person um, should be incarcerated in that period, there are going to be factors brought to bear, brought to the attention of the person, the, the bail commissioner or the magistrate or whomever, and that person can make a decision on an individualized basis rather than merely being driven by the nature of the offense. Your testimony. Um, the court calls Attorney Richard Head. Is that, excuse me, the, we're talking about court so much. The chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Richard Head. I'm the Government Affairs Coordinator for the Judicial Branch. Um, somewhat different in this bill than the last bill. I do have some data I wanted to share with you um, regarding the impact of this bill and also a confluence of a couple of events that's going to occur on January 1st in circuit court. So unrelated to this bill, but already passed in a previous session of the legislature, we have the repeal of felonies first. So under current practice, felonies are initiated in superior court, misdemeanors and violations are initiated in circuit court come January 1st, and that, uh, and that process is called Felonies First. Felonies First start in Superior Court, and that was implemented in around 2015. In the last session, um, Felonies First was repealed, so we go back to an older system in which all cases, felonies, misdemeanors, violations, will initiate in, in Circuit Court. Um, so none of those cases, virtually none of those cases will initiate in Superior Court. So come January 1st, 
our circuit court is going to have an influx of felonies that are not currently being absorbed into the system and we have to absorb those into the system. And so what that means in terms of, of what is circuit court. So circuit court is made up of three divisions, uh, district division where the criminal cases are heard, family division where you have the family type of, of cases and probate division where the, where the probate cases are heard. All of those are heard in circuit court same judges are hearing the same cases in all those divisions. We don't, we don't separate them out. Probate's a little bit different. So within, within circuit court, we have 42 judges. And um, on top of that, we have some part-time judges who are essentially retired. Um, and they hear and they receive on an annual basis under the current system, about 127,000 new cases every year. So we have 42 plus judges going through that. We have court staff processing all of those cases. It is a tremendous burden that occurs within the circuit court system. Come January 1st, felonies first will be repealed and we're gonna add into that system somewhere around eight to 9,000 new criminal cases that are not currently being absorbed into the circuit court system because they're starting currently in, in Superior Court and we're moving those into Circuit Court. So brand new cases, not currently in the dockets in the Circuit Court. And those will all now have to get opened by Circuit Court staff. They will all have to get heard by Circuit Court judges. And those cases that are felonies, if they don't plea down to a misdemeanor in Circuit Court at arraignment um, or probable, uh, probable cause hearing will then get transferred and restart over in Superior Court. And that's the, the system that you sort of approved last, last session. What this does, so, we, so that's coming January 1st um, and is, is a process that is taking up a, a fair amount of court staff time currently to try to figure out how to, how to do it and how to do it smoothly. What this, case, what this bill adds to that are cases that are not currently being heard as detention hearings, detention bail hearings, and adds the uh, into the load detention bail hearings. And we do have some data that suggests about how many we're going to have post felonies first repeal. And, and it's somewhere in the neighborhood of approximately 3,400 new detention bail hearings that currently are, are not coming to the court as a detention bail hearing, essentially meaning that a bail commissioner has uh, likely issued a, a personal recognizance bail, um, and so the person's not being detained and it's not coming to the court as a detention hearing. So those then, so for the folks who were at court yesterday in the Spirit Court, those are the ones that are likely to be heard on that video arraignments that we saw the, the judge do uh, at 10 o'clock, and, and those are likely to be folks who are now in the county jail um, who are going to be video arraigned uh, into the court uh, on a daily basis. So those th that load just sort of has to get added in. So what does that mean? And in, in addition to having absorbed felonies first in, into the system, we now have to absorb these bail hearings. And these bail hearings may not be one-offs because if that bail hearing um, occurs in the first instance, a detention bail hearing, and a public defender has not been assigned. For those of you who saw yesterday, the judge will ask the individual, do you want to argue your bail today, or do you want to wait until a bail, until a, 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 a lawyer is assigned to you? And that might be tomorrow, because if you're in detention, um, public defenders do quickly assign a, uh, a lawyer to that case. If you're not in detention, uh, and you're charged with a with a crime, and you're eligible for uh, for a lawyer. It can take 180 days sometimes for a lawyer to get appointed, and then the process can essentially start. If you're detained, it's going to happen quickly. Um, so that might mean okay, we've had the the hearing today. The individual has decided I don't want to argue bail today. I want to wait till my lawyer is assigned. The lawyer gets assigned. The lawyer files bail paperwork. We got to have another hearing within. Um, 24 hours of that of that paperwork being filed. So that's two hearings now that may occur as a result of that detention hearing. And then if the decision is uh, one that results in further detention by the judge, that 
that bail decision could be appealed. So there might be a third uh, hearing that comes out of that, but I'll focus on the one. So what we're talking about, let's say we're adding 3,400 new hearings, detention hearings into the system, and let's say each one of those hearings takes six minutes. That's probably low, but let's, let's just say it takes six minutes. If we do that and add, up, add that over 3,400 uh, new hearings, that adds what are called uh, 46 session days to our schedule. And a session day is essentially the seven and a half hours that a judge has in a courtroom available uh, to hear cases. So that's one session day. We have to add into the system 46 session days just to handle that first round of hearings from detention bail hearings. So what does that mean since, since you're not a finance group, you're a policy group, what, how, what, how does that impact you? That means within the system, we have to absorb 46 days of time of a judge not doing something else. So what is it the judge has discretion to do or not do that can add and absorb 46 days into the system? So there are a number of things that by statute we have to do within a, a certain period of time. So landlord tenant has a, a 10 day deadline. You got to have a hearing. Um, juvenile cases have statutory hearings. Abuse and neglect cases have statutory hearings uh, and deadlines. So there's a number of things that have statutory deadlines. We got to hear these cases and we got to hear them within a certain period of time. If we add up the total number of judges we have currently, 42 plus the part-time judges that are, that are retired, we have a total number of session days available to us. So the number of seven and a half hour days that these total, that these judges can sit in front of a, uh, in a courtroom uh, in total is about 16,000 session days. So we can cover 16,000 session days with our judges to hear all the cases. Of those 16,000, about 5,000 of, 5, of them are locked into those things that have statutory deadlines. So we just have to get those things done. Um, so that's about 5,000. That 5,000 does not include the criminal cases. That's about another 3,000 uh, session days, so or 3,500 actually. So now if we add all the things with statutory deadlines in our criminal cases, of the, of the 16,000 session days available, we've consumed about 8,500 of them. And so what that means is those things that have discretionary deadlines, we don't have to do it. It's not a statute. There's not a constitution that says we have to do it. Those are getting pushed. And the reality is those are getting pushed. So what type of cases are we talking about? Civil cases. Your small claims cases are getting reached much later than we would like them to. But that's because we're doing all these other things. So civil cases get pushed. Uh, divorce cases don't have deadlines. Those get pushed. And I spend a lot of time in, in the Children and Family Law Committee, and I hear a lot of complaints about that. Our cases aren't getting reached. Um, uh, some, you know, some there, so there's some equity cases, some trust cases. You know, the things that don't have a deadline just naturally because you're pushing only so much into a system, they get pushed later. Uh, and you hear about those things. So it's, you know, it's, it becomes a very intensive resource issue. And in and, and, and these numbers, I'm only talking about judges so far. On top of that, within our clerk's offices, um, they, because of felonies first repeal, have to absorb another eight, 9,000 cases into what they do uh, in the work that they do. And if I took just to open a case, let's say it's a half an hour to open a case, for for um, for these types of cases that we're talking about in this bill, separating out felonies first, we have to absorb about another 226 days worth of work by by court staff um, in order to process the additional materials. If you assume each one and, and bail commissioners know the paperwork alone for these things takes a while um, in getting it processed, so we have to absorb that into the system. And what we also know is that based upon a, a study that um, was conducted on our system last year from the National Center of State Courts, that we currently are short, if we don't add felonies first into it, if we don't add bail reform into it, in circuit court, we're short about 17 judges and we're short about 31, 30, 
30 plus in terms of staff. And we have in, the, in our budget this year, the Chief Justice has, uh, has asked for significant resources and we ask for support of that in the sense of, of the 17 judges that are suggested, he's asked for seven. Um, of the court staff, he's asked for 31, um, but he has not factored into you know, the additional workload that would be added by new legislation. Um, so I, I think in terms of, of the impacts, and we don't have any view on the policy. We look at how does this impact court operations? And the only purpose of my testimony is to give you that in, insight as you are deliberating on the policy uh, goals of this bill is that they will have impacts within the court system. There's only so much that the system can absorb. And as we take on more, it just means stuff gets pushed. You know, we hear complaints and they're perfectly legitimate issues that a court mis issues an order that doesn't get mailed out for two or three weeks sometimes um, because that court staff is doing 20 other things before they can get to the mailing of that order. Um, and that's just a reality of, of the work within the circuit court. So anytime we're adding um, loads into the circuit court system, we're, we're stressing what is a, a system that already has a fairly high level of, of stress. Um, but again, I do want to emphasize we have absolutely no position on the policy goals of this. If this is the, the direction that, that the legislature wants to take, we have no view on that. It is simply um, the need then to accommodate the, the resources and also the understanding of what that results in, in terms of impact on cases that are not criminal, that are not statutory deadlines and, and the effect that it has. With that, I would conclude my comments, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we were to take, um, for example, the, the magistrate system contemplated in the study committee by Representative Perry Gathright's bill, um, would, that, um, would that alleviate some of the stress in, in the system? Um, so thank you for the question. Yes, absolutely. Um, it would, well, we would see the, the responsibility of someone along the lines of a magistrate would be to do a lot within as employees of the system trained within the system and hopefully a smaller number, um, so that we can get some consistency within that group. Um, they would handle a lot of the paperwork that would be, uh, done by a clerk's, uh, office and, would be making the decision that a judge would currently be making. Um, so it does offload some of that, the, the stresses there. It doesn't eliminate all of the, the sort of work within the clerk's office. So there's still, no matter what, going to be an increased burden within the clerk's offices. Um, but that would alleviate sort of the in-court time that we're talking about, at least in the first hearing role, um, as you know, the, the um, you get the issues of, of um, waiting for the appointment of, of a public defender or second or third um, attempts at the, at the bail decision, the, those would be less, those would still impact the courts in the same way. But in the first round, that would definitely have a, a positive impact in terms of helping resource needs. So in, in the opinion of the court, uh, via your opinion, would, um, would passing, for example, the current bill we're discussing at the same time as we began that that process of that study commission for that would that be a wise decision um so thank you for the question i think i think it'd be an excellent idea um it you know one we don't want to be implementing um that process today because i think we might have some some people break down if we had <laughs> if we did that yeah. um but it is a system i think has substantial merit and if we can um, identify through a legislative process the best way to implement that in conjunction with um, bail commissioner roles and and just how we would um, how we would bring that into fruition and also you know how would we start to to accommodate electronic bail which we do not currently do um, and and some other benefits I think if we can study the the use of bail commissioners and the use of a new system of magistrates at the same time we're implementing this uh, type of legislation i think that would be a, a an excellent um, combination thank you further questions from the committee representative newman thank you um my question has to do with the the limitations that are in this bill the 20 the uh, 24 hours 
but they all exclude holidays and and, <clears throat> and weekends. And additionally, it, it also has language in there between if you're arrested between 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. and the person's attorney is not available, which would probably be the case with public attorney. Um, and it also has that 36 hours, and then it says not including Saturdays and holidays. So it seems like the elimination of the dis of the discretion being taken away from the judges and the bail commissioners may have an even greater impact if this bill is passed than probably the statistics you just uh, mentioned or did you include that in your analysis? Um, so thank you for the question. I, I have two parts, I think, to my answer. One is the... Um, for folks who are, so detention hearings happen currently, um, and these rules apply to, to those folks. Um, so, the, uh, so the Saturday, Sundays, holidays, and the eight to one thing are all uh, exist under the current system of detention hearings, which, which we have. Um, in terms of the impact on the courts, what in, in every one of our circuit courts, Monday mornings are a huge bail day. I mean, that's all they can do. Um, and that's what they do. And this, you know, adds to what is going to happen on a Monday bail hearing day. Um, so the, the, the burden on this is really focused, not so much on the totals that I gave, because those totals are the same. It affects the distribution so that what we're talking about is, is Monday morning is going to be Monday morning, Monday afternoon, um, and sort of balancing one of the other aspects of, of what the clerk has to do is, and, and what the counties have to do, because these are all people that will be incarcerated in a county jail, is coordinating the individual so that at a particular time they're sitting in front of the camera that is set up in uh, Concord Circuit Court so that the judge in Concord Circuit Court is seeing the person who is, who is in Merrimack County Jail at the same time at the right time so that we have this process and the in the clerk's offices coordinate that um, with the county jails and that in and of itself is just a process and in part what we just don't know is what is the maximum number of video hearings that we can have at, in one day because within the county system they typically have one camera available in, in one room available for their video arraignments. And once that maxes out, so once you've hit capacity of that system and people have to be arraigned on a particular day, that's going to result in more transports from the county to the courthouse. Um, so, the, so then we have the coordination of the sheriff's offices to transport an individual from the county jail to the courthouse um, and possibly back to the county jail. Um, so there's there's a great deal of coordination that has to happen both in terms of video and uh, in transport that all has to happen in a very short window of time um, in terms of the coordination and even knowing sort of who's going to, who's subject to these things. Um, so there, there's a great deal of work, but it, what, what, in terms of what you highlighted, that sort of focuses a great deal of attention on Monday morning. Thank you for your answer. Follow up. So I, I guess I just want to get to the basic question. Does the, does the loss of discretion without having bail commissioners available make the situation with felonies first on the circuit court more better or, or worse? Because um, that discretion is not there. So what it does is, is it adds what I said at the beginning, which is about 3,500 new hearings. So that's 3,500 events where today a bail commissioner might be handling that, that under this bill would bypass bail commissioners and have that person appear in front of a judge. Um, so it's about 3,500 cases uh, annually that currently, based on sort of past our past numbers, um, would now result in a detention hearing before a circuit court judge that currently doesn't have that detention hearing process. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wishing to testify on this bill or was not testified in this bill? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing on Senate Bill 252. The committee will be in recess for- Mr. Uh, Chairman, I wonder if we'd be able to, or 
We're this? going to. Okay. Let me just finish. We're going to um, be in recess for about um, 40 minutes. Um, we're going to have Republicans. We're going to have a short caucus right now. And um, then we'll meet back, everybody, in about 40 minutes. Yeah, we are. We're going to exec a few of these other bills. No, no.
Good afternoon. At this point, we are going to open the executive sessions, and we are going to begin with Senate Bill number 130. And I recognize Representative Janverin for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move ought to pass on Senate Bill 130. Second. Would you like to speak to your motion, Representative? Um, it's quite obvious that the judicial branch needs this type of training available, and the police standards and training is willing to do so, so I, the bill should pass and allow them to work to collaboratively. Representative Stone, would you like to speak to your second? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I would. After hearing testimony, I think it's a prudent course of action to get the addressed training needs that they desire. Further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Motion on the floor is out to pass in Senate Bill 130. Vice Chair Rhodes? Yes. Representative Pratt? Not here. No. Representative Sitek? Yes. Representative Prue? Yes. Representative Janfran? Yes. Representative Mannion? Yes. Representative Reed? Yes. Representative Stone? Yes. Representative Tenzar? Yes. Representative Gathright? Yes. Representative Muse? Yes. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Sunuman? Yes. Representative Murphy? Yes. Representative Rayneman? Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Newell? Yes. Representative Salig? Yes. Representative Wheeler? Yay. Chairman Roy? Chair votes yes. Motion is unanimous 19-0. motion being unanimously ought to pass on Senate Bill 130. Is there any objection to consent? Hearing none, it will go on the consent calendar, and I hereby close the executive session. And does anyone know where Representative Pratt is? We do not. Can you hold on for one second? I have to go get my green form from there. See if you can find Representative Pratt. At this point, I'm going to open the executive session on Senate Bill 249, and I'm going to recognize myself for a motion. I'm going to move to retain. Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded by <laughs> Representative Harriet Gathright. And I will speak to my motion. Um, and this is going to be a broad, uh, broad reaching speech generally on bail. Um, as the committee knows, at the beginning of this year, I made a commitment to everyone that we were going to retain these bills and we were going to find the best um, parts of them in order to come up with a good piece of legislation. Politics being what it is, um, we need to come up with something this year. And I, I'm going to work with um, Representative Harry Gathright to come up with a good piece of legislation based on um, a couple of them that are in front of us. And one of those is not Representative um, Senator Abbas's bill. So we are going to retain that um, like we did all the other ones. And we're going to continue to work over this weekend and come up with something that I hope we can all support. Um, so having said that, um, with regard to this bill, um, I don't believe that the support is there for it, regardless of how any of us may feel. 
Um, I think it's best to hold off. Let's retain it with the other ones and see what we can come up with in the meantime that we can get to the floor that will pass the whole body and that we know will pass the Senate. Um, would you like to speak to your second, Representative Gathright? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as stated, um, we've had a lot of conversations about all the bills that we've had that related to bail or bail reform. Um, and for the most part, the committee has uh, agreed that we would um, save one for a committee so that we could kind of take, really do a deep dive in. So um, I'm going to ask everyone to um, vote yay on this particular bill and see what happens after that. Thank you. Um, and I would just add that it, it has not been um, easy retaining all these bills, as I'm sure some of you know. There's been enormous pressure brought to bear, and I have stood and held it to this point. But as we get closer, um, it's becoming more and more evident that we need to we need to move a little bit quicker on some of these. So that's what we're going to work hard over to do. Um, any further discussion on the retention of this bill? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. A motion on the floor is to retain. Vice Chair Rhodes? Yes. Representative Pratt? Yes. Representative Sytek? <laughs> Representative Prue? No. Representative Janvrin? Aye. Representative Mannion? No. Representative Reed? Yes. Representative Stone? Yes. Representative Tenzar? Yes. Representative Gathright? Yes. Representative Muse? Yes. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Newman? Osu Newman? Yes. Representative Murphy? Yes. Representative Ray Newman? Yes. The clerk votes no. Representative Newell? Yes. Representative Salig? Yes. Representative Wheeler? I started this trend and I will proudly vote yay. <laughs> Chairman Roy? The chair votes aye. Motion is 17-3. Motion carries. The bill is retained. I hereby close the executive session. I open the executive session on Senate Bill 245 and I recognize a Representative Oh, Murphy for a uh, motion. Yeah, we're going to do that first. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have an amendment that's been handed out. Um, I think everybody has a copy. And I would like to uh, move to uh, to pass um, with this amendment. Yeah, we're moving, we'll move we're moving to adopt the amendment. Um, second, is anyone second? Second. Seconded by Representative Prue. Mr. Chair, if it, yeah, I would just like to make it clear. It's uh, if everybody has that amendment 2023-1305H. Representative Murphy, would you like to speak to your uh, motion? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, this bill, um, uh, excuse me, this statute uh, is an old one from, I believe, the 1920s. And... Uh, came before us at the uh, the uh, behest of uh, the hotel association stakeholders um, given uh, a need for an update and um, this uh, current amendment will address the issue they had the, that required before a book or card system um, method of bookkeeping which is certainly outdated um, and they would like to have the option to use more current uh, data collection kind of um, tools like computers and those kinds of things. So um, this amendment um, does a few things. It changes the uh, requirement for a book or card system to be held and now will just re uh, require that a record of the registered guests will be, would be kept. Um, it also deleted the word each um, as it, re they, it re referenced guests who were um, required to provide their name for the hotel record. It also deleted the um, necessity uh, and the reference to sign as, it, as to a signature for registering guests. Um, so now it's just their, their name. 
and it also deleted the option for a registering guest to use any name other than their legal name. Um, so it's pretty simple, um, but will meet the needs of the um, stakeholders. And um, you know, it was a lot of discussion amongst members, and I think this is a is a, is a good amendment. We'll address the issue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Pru. Would you like to speak to your second? Was what it she said? Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I agree with uh, some of the members um, that it, the bill did raise an interesting question, and actually some random citizen testified that brought that, um, that in light of the constitutional amendment we just passed, it is worthy of uh, further discussion as to whether or not that should continue to be allowed or it should be tailored or, or all done, with all, all done away with altogether. Um, having said that, I don't want to punish the, the folks that brought this forward asking for a simple fix by making it into a, a huge thing at this point. Um, I am going to look at it over the summer and speak with some folks and see if it's uh, legislation is possibly beneficial in the fall. But right now we're just going to fix what they asked us to and we'll examine the issue that came up during testimony later. Any further discussion? Representative Salik, I saw you represent. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just if you're working on something that would uh, get rid of this outdated law or add a warrant requirement, I'd be happy to work with you in a bipartisan way on that. And I appreciate that. I'm not sure either one of those is what will happen, but we're going to look at it and see. Um, Representative Sytek. I intend to vote aye, yes, or uh, uh, yay, depending on what whatever is going on at the moment. But I share the concern. We have a right to privacy, and you said it all, and uh, I think we have to keep that in mind. Thanks. Seeing no further discussion, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. The motion on the floor is ought to pass. Oh, so adopt the amendment. Vice Chair Rhodes? Yes. Representative Pratt? Yes. Representative Sytek? Aye. Representative Prue? Yes. Representative Janvrin? Yes. Representative Mannion? Yes. Representative Reed? Yes. Representative Stone? Yes. Representative Tenzar? Yes. Representative Gathright? Yes. Representative Muse? Yes. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Sue Newman? Yes. Representative Murphy? Yes. Representative Ray Newman? Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Newell? Yes. Representative Salig? Yes. Representative Wheeler? Yay. Chairman Roy? Yeah, yes. Um, amendment is adopted 20-0. The amendment was adopted. It's now open for further motion. I recognize Representative Murphy. I move uh, that we vote ought to pass as amended. A second. Yeah. Would you like to speak to your motion, Representative Murphy? Uh, no, I think that I think everything was said. Thank you. Representative Jambrin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think I may have told the committee that uh, we had an incident in the town of Seabrook recently where a false alarm was called into the police by a person that was in the Uber trying to protect her boyfriend from being arrested for shoplifting. And it turned out to be a active shooter slash bomb threat. Um, through the investigation, uh, the police were able to determine where this person was staying by utilizing this law. They were able to call the, the hotel and say, do you have so-and-so registered here? And they said yes. So this law helped the investigation and quick re resolution of that, uh, that incident in the town of Seabrook. So I support the bill as amended. Thank you, Representative. And I do think that there is a certain value in the law, um, especially given the transient nature of people in a, in a hotel versus people who have, there's a record of where they live in a permanent residence. But I do think we have to balance that with the, um, the um, wishes of the people for privacy. So I will be looking at both sides of that very closely if we think of any new um, legislation that would be necessary. Um, further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Oh, Representative Saitek. I just can't help but observe we can get make a lot uh, law enforcement a lot easier by getting rid of the Fourth Amendment on reasonable search and seizure. Just going. I think that would be a different motion. Um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. 
and um, the motion on the floor is ought to pass as amended. Vice Chair Rhodes? Yes. Representative Pratt? Yes. Representative Sytek? Yes. Representative Prue? Yes. Representative Janvrin? Yes. Representative Mannion? Yes. Representative Reed? Yes. Representative Stone? Yes. Representative Tenzar? Yes. Representative Gathright? Yes. Representative Muse? Yes. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Sue Newman? Yes. Representative Murphy? Yes. Representative Ray Newman? Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Newell? Yes. Representative Salig? Yep. Representative Wheeler? Yay. Chairman Roy? Chair votes yes. Motion is unanimous. The uh, motion of ought to pass is amended is unanimous. And anyone object to consent? Seeing none, it will go on the consent calendar. I hereby close the executive session. And what's next? I hereby open the executive session on Senate Bill number 76. And I recognize Representative Rhodes for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to ask the committee to reconsider their vote on um, Senate Bill 76. Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Wheeler. Would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, I would. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, so just as a friendly reminder to Senate Bill 76, it was the bill that had to do with reporting uh, a death if a person comes across it and or the lack of not reporting it when you know about it. And uh, the committee all worked, you know, really hard and we, you know, I hurried up and I got the amendment taken care of. And then that day we were working very quickly to move through. And when the Senate bill came back, we were the amendment, we all completely forgot to put the title of the bill. And our friend uh, Representative Wheeler remembered after we all voted and we found out we needed to hold on to that in order to, to introduce that amendment to name the bill. And I would just ask everybody to please reconsider so that we can do that for this family. And could you refresh us on what the name and why? Oh, sure. Uh, Matt. What's Maryland. It? Maryland. I think I believe that this is going to be called Maryland's Law, and it was the um, the young lady that testified. It, very unfortunate that her grandmother had passed away, and it seems that a, a family member just chose to not report that. And this bill will be named after the the woman's grandmother. Thank you, Representative uh, Wheeler. Would you like to speak to your second? I have nothing to add to what Re Representative Rhodes said, other than to say that Representative Mannion was actually the person who reminded me. I was just the one who did the legwork, but. Real great teamwork there. Um, <laughs> any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on reconsideration. Vice Chair Rhodes? Yes. Representative Pratt? Yes. Representative Sytek? Yes. Representative Prue? Sure. Representative Janvrin? Absolutely. Representative Mannion? Yes. Representative Reed? Yes. Representative Stone? Yes. Representative Tenzar? Yes. Representative Gathright? Yes. Representative Muse? Yes. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Sue Newman? Yes. Representative Murphy? Yes. Representative Ray Newman? Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Newell? Yes. Representative Salig? Yep. Representative Wheeler? Chairman Roy? Chair votes yes. Motion is unanimous. Motion is unanimous. The vote is open for reconsideration. And I recognize Representative Wheeler for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I motion ought to pass on SB 76 and would offer Amendment 1325H for Second. consideration. Seconded by Representative Mannion. And the motion is to adopt Amendment 1325H to SB 76. I have a question. I have a question. Can the committee recommend two amendments because it was already amended? We already passed an amendment. So when it goes to the floor, will it will it have two amendments? No, because we have to pass the committee amendment on the floor. We can also reject it. Okay, so um, would you like to speak to your motion, Representative Wheeler? 
I think Representative Rhodes said it very well. This is just to honor the grandmother of the woman who took the time to come speak before us and gave us really heartfelt and powerful testimony that I think we all took with heart. And uh, I, it's a good honor to pass this legislation and an even better one to honor her wish to name it after her grandmother. So, Thank you. Um, would, would you like to speak to your second, Representative Manny? I was covered. Thank you. Any further discussion? I have a quick question. Go ahead. It, Mr. Chair, so I do have a question, actually. Um, so we just reconsidered the vote. So does that actually, that, that null and voids everything we did last week? So do we actually have to now vote on the amendment that was first brought that had the language that we wanted? Uh, I think that all we reconsidered was the final vote, which was ought to pass. Okay, very good, very good. Okay. After we had already adopted the amendment. Okay. Um, I am going to hold on to this, though, but after we vote today, just to make sure it's okay with the clerk in case we need to take it up again to readopt all the amendments. I don't know. Okay. Um, who else had a okay. representative Pru? Not a big fan of naming bills because we start with this one and then we're going to have to name every bill. So, unless there's something really important that a name needs to go with it not a fan Representative Wheeler just in response to what representative Pruce said I I hear that concern um, I think there has been two bills that we've seen already in this committee that have had names one of them last week and I was so I, I hear that concern but I I think this is an instance in which naming the legislation is, is warranted You could, Representative um, um, Bolden. Thanks. Um, not to be controversial, but anyone who has a problem with the proposed amendment could take the opportunity to make a restroom break or something out of respect for the family, given the subject matter, um, for what it's worth. We don't name a lot of stuff. Just a suggestion. You don't always have to vote, especially it because it's an amendment, and I'm sure we're all in agreement. It is a legitimate um, suggestion. Representative Sytek. My heart's not really in this because I, uh, I don't like to vote for resolutions and I don't like to vote for naming laws. So I'm going to agree with Representative Prue, but I will, of course, vote for the amended bill. Thank you. I, I see that um, both, of the, um, both of the representatives who grew up in EDNA <laughs> seem to not like naming bills. I, I feel uh, that, um, yeah, okay. Any further discussion? Oh, Representative Newman. Uh, oh, yes on this vote for the amendment does not really change the bill. It will always be referred to by the official name, and this is just a short title, and it's a note in the bill itself. Yeah, I don't even believe that this would show up in the books, uh, that this name part, I don't think, um, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it's not in chapter law, Representative Bolden. I'm personally feeling really anxious about this two amendments thing, so I'm just going to go call Paul. As I said. We already talked to Paul. Oh, you already talked to him? Oh, I guess I missed that detail. Okay. Yeah, and anyway, I'm going to have Karen hold on to it for a day or so, so I can check to make sure. Okay, it's still I in just our possession. would hate to have to have this whole I, I conversation all over again. Yeah. You told us to hold on to it until so today. Yeah. That's what we're doing. Okay, I'll ask the court to call the roll. The motion is ought to pass as amended. Vice Chair Rhodes? Yes. Representative Pratt? Yes. Representative Sytek? Representative Prue? No, thank you. Representative Janvrin? Yes. Representative Mannion? Yes. Representative Reed? Yes. Representative Stone? Yes. Representative Tenzar? Yes. Representative Gathright? Representative Muse? Yes. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Sue Newman? Yes. Representative Murphy? Yes. Representative Ray Newman? Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Newell? Yes. Representative Selig? Yes. Representative Wheeler? Yay. Chairman Roy? Yes. Um, vote is 18 2. Is there any objection to consent? Oh, what was this? We just oh, so all that talk. I thought we already did that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you were confused too? 
Okay, uh, at this point, I, I... What's that? <laughs> Representative Wheeler, I recognize you for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I motion OTP as amended for Senate Bill 76. Seconded by Representative Manning. Any further discussion is necessary, is there? God, I hope not. Please call the roll. <laughs> Vice Chair Rhodes? Yes. Representative Pratt? Yes. Representative Cytek? Aye. Representative Prue? Negative. Representative Janvrin? Yes. Representative Mannion? Yes. Representative Reed? Yes. Representative Stone? Yes. Representative Tensar? Yes. Representative Gathright? Yes. Representative Muse? Yes. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative uh, Sunuman? Yes. Representative Murphy? Yes. Representative Ray Newman? Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Newell? Yes. Representative Salig? Yes. Representative Wheeler? Nay. Nay? Oh. I had something in my throat. I popped. Yay. Yes. <laughs> Chairman Roy? Chair votes yes. Vote is 19 1. Representative Prue, do you object to consent? Uh, no. <laughs> it is closed and we'll go on consent. At this point, I'm going to open the executive session on no, not represent uh, on SB 244, and I'm going to recess the executive session on 244, and I'm going to open. Is there anything else I had to open and close? 252 is is that the one? Oh yeah, and I'm going to open the executive session on Senate Bill 252, and I'm going to recess the executive session on 252. And the committee is done for the day. We will tentatively be meeting again next Wednesday to take up these two bills. Yes. Which one is that? Oh, because I'm working on that one. I might be doing an amendment. I might be doing an amendment to that. Yeah, we have till June. Yeah. The email you sent me after the hateful email that I got, your response was very thoughtful and kind, and I just wanted to let the committee know I really appreciated your support after having gotten such ugly speech sent to me. Yeah, that that person is um, is. I don't even want to say. Right, but I, we're I just want to, I want to be public in thanking you for, for your response. I really appreciate it. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I have anything else before we go? All right. Enjoy your long weekends. And just for the record. Yeah, I was tricking Mr. you. Mr. Chairman. Also, um, just for you know, um, yeah, we have a session tomorrow. Try not to forget that. And... No, he, I had a train of thought, and he just drove it right into a ditch. I don't know what it was. Next week? What about a committee? Next week's schedule? Oh, yeah, next week, um, we're going to do these two bills, and we're done for the year. Yeah, you said that once before. Yeah, I know. Um, we could have been done today. We could have been, but you voted no on that name loss. On... Are we recessed or no? Or is the meeting closed? Yeah, give it a minute, Jonah. You'll see. So, Mr. Chairman, Representative Janvert, be quiet. We have to redo our redo. Yes. So last week, um, Representative Wheeler called the House clerk and he, he told us to hold on to 
He told us to hold on to the blurb and to not submit it to his office for us to reconsider our vote. And we misunderstood when he when he told Representative Wheeler to just write the amendment renaming the bill. I believe what he meant was rewrite rewrite the amendment renaming the bill in with the amendment that was already written with all the language. So now we need another amendment to bring it all together. So, <clears throat> okay, so we're not going to transmit that bill. We're going to hold it and we'll vote, take it up Wednesday. In the meantime, someone will get the amendment of the amendment on the amendment. Who who owes me a like a coffee or something? Could have saved us the trouble. No, I don't think so because we don't have the amendment. 